everyone. Welcome to the Bread Beckers. All right, we are ready. Are y'all ready for the everything chocolate? Yay! I noticed there are no men in the room, but that's okay. Uh, well, I'm just going, hey, Brad. Not seated anyway. I actually found some little trivia. I have had so much fun do, getting ready for this class. Um, I actually found some little trivia that when men crave food, they usually crave fat and salty. And um, when women crave food, it typically involves chocolate. So, and there's some reasons for that that we'll get into um, in just a little bit. But I do want to welcome you to the Everything Chocolate class here at the Bread Beckers. Anybody um, here for the very first time? Oh, you picked a good one. We're going to have candy, as my little girl says. She did say when she was little. She's not so little anymore. Okay, raise your hand again if you're here for the very first time. Golly, golly, I just want to welcome you so much. I'm Sue Becker, one of the owners, and um, I tell everybody I'm the cause of the chaos, so that's who I am. Um, these are two of my lovely daughters, Ashley and Abigail. They're going to be my helpers today, and um, without whom I couldn't do a whole lot. So i um, just very thankful. Yeah, <laughs> Ashley's my brain. Ashley's my oldest, so um, she got most of the brain cells because I still had some. Abby's, Abby's my fifth child. Um, yeah, <laughs> not after the three boys. There was Ashley and then three boys and then Abigail, Lydia. Then we had three girls, Abigail, Lydia, and Olivia. And then we adopted two boys, stuck them in the, um, just above the youngest. So my baby is still the baby, spoiled, spoiled, spoiled. But anyway, yeah, I admit it. So anyway, but I just do really, really, really want to welcome you. I'm, like I said, I'm so excited um, about this class. I've had just so much fun, and God was so good to me, and maybe it's just that everything was chocolate that I was trying, but when I test recipes, so oftentimes I'll do something, and I think I've got my class all planned, and none of it comes out. I'm like, yuck, I don't like that, and then I have to go back to this drawing board. I've been test recipeing for this class since just after Christmas, and um, I just have to tell you, everything came out great. I think it's just because it was all chocolate. I mean, like, how could it not come out great? So we're going to um, serve some wonderful things for you today. I hope you, those coffee drinkers, um, we added a tablespoon of ground cacao nibs. Cacao nibs are the raw chocolate. Um, and I'll tell you about that in just a few minutes, what that is. We added a tablespoon per cup to the coffee, so you've got a little hint of um, the chocolate mixed in with our raw, um, our, raw our organic coffees that we um, sell here. And then the hot chocolate that we made for you is our um, cacao syrup. It's just sweetened with agave nectar, and it's the raw chocolate. And so we just heated the milk and then stirred the chocolate in. Um, I don't find this to be quite sweet enough, neither do my children. It, it um, got a little bit of the bite to it still. If you like dark chocolate, you'll love this. But um, so we did sweeten the chocolate with just the hot chocolate with just a little bit of agave nectar and a little splash of vanilla. And so you just add it till it's as chocolate as you like it. So I didn't put a recipe in your handout um, for that because it just kind of kind of tasted a little bit and see how you like it. But it was probably for four cups, we do a spoonful of the syrup for, for each cup. And like I said, just keep stirring it until it melts, if it's, until you get it as chocolate. I don't really like chocolatey chocolate, but some, my kids, some of them do. And then just a tablespoon or so of agave nectar, just to add a little sweetener, and then the vanilla. So anyway, but um, I know everybody's thinking about Valentine's Day. We wore red, and I'm using all my red accessories. And I found this. I did a um, road trip a few weeks ago. I had a speaking circuit all the way down in Florida, drove all the way down to Miami and did three speaking engagements, kind of working my way back. And when we ended up at Vero Beach, um, there was a little chocolate right out our window. We had a balcony. It was like, chocolate store we're going over there and that was our first little visit when we got checked after we checked in our hotel and so i found this um apron it says there's no stress that can't be handled without a prayer and chocolate so i think how appropriate how appropriate but you know this is a month that we kind of think about those that we love valentine's day is coming up and i know it's a very worldly um worldly maybe uh holiday but you know, God wants us to love all the time because he is love. And um, on the way home from uh, my Florida trip, Sharon, that was traveling with me, we listened to some teaching tapes, and um, it was all about love. And I just thought, I just had this, I mean, his teaching just gave me a very profound 
Revelation. And I just want to read the scripture that he was teaching on. It's John 13, 34, and 35. And this is Jesus right before he was going to die. And he said to the disciples, you know, I, oftentimes when we think, I've been there, when you think you might die, you start thinking about all the people that you really want to tell that you love. And um, so it's just very interesting, the same with Jesus. You know, right before he knew he was going to die, he starts telling them, okay, this is what I need to leave you with. My peace, I'm going to leave you, and y'all don't be scared, and, you know, all this. But this was right... Um, not too long. I mean, it wasn't right the day, the night of, but it says, John 13, 34 and 35. I give you a new commandment that you should love one another just as I have loved you. So too, you should love one another. How often I've read that scripture and missed this. He just said, I'm giving you a new commandment. When he was asked what was the most important commandment, he said what? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And to love your neighbor, what did he say? As yourself. So up until that moment, we were to be loving each other as ourselves. But just before he dies, he says, I'm giving you a new commandment. You are to love each other just as I have loved you. Wow. How has Jesus loved us? He has forgiven us. He sees, have you ever thought about this? He sees all the mistakes, all the He sees everything. He knows what we're going to do before we even do it. Doesn't make us do it, but he knows. And yet he still loves us. Yet he still, even dying on the cross, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And they'd spit on him, lashed out at him. And one time I even taught a teaching on, um, you know, the night that he washed their feet. It's so interesting. That story begins knowing that his hour had come and that Judas was going to betray him. Wow. Knowing that Judas was going to betray him, how many, how many of y'all, if you knew somebody was just going to be ugly to you and that you were fixing to die, wouldn't you just kind of go, I'm not going to that dinner. I'm, just, I'm not going to go eat with them. Why should I go eat with them? There's a jerk there. I don't want to, I don't. No, and he took off the towel. He washed his feet. Knowing what was fixing to happen, he did this. So that's the way Jesus is now telling him, I'm leaving you with a new commandment. I want you to love others the way I have loved you. So I hope that you'll think about that with Valentine's Day coming up. And not just Valentine's Day, because it goes on to say, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you love one another. This is our testimony to the world. As the world sees us loving that person at work that's a jerk to us or our boss or whatever, and just continuing to love that's a testimony of who we are, and that's how our light, I think, is going to shine so much more than our words sometimes. So I just wanted to share that with you today because it had a very profound effect on me um, hearing that. I was like, wow, I just read that verse so many times and never really saw that. So let's just open them with prayer, and then we'll start making the donuts. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful time together. And I just really, really want to thank you for the food that you've given us, everything that you've you've created to nourish our bodies and that it's not boring it's very delicious it's good for us it it sustains our life not only that but it gives us health and we just thank you for the variety and all the many things that you've given us in the way of food and we just ask that you forgive us for complaining saying i don't like healthy food it doesn't taste good because your provisions are perfect and they're wonderful and they are very tasty i thank you for this time together for all that you've shown me during these weeks preparing and i just pray a blessing on every household represented here that you would just in everything we say and do this morning just that it would bring glory to your name. Bless the hands that have helped me and that are helping me this morning. We just give you praise and honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, I have resting here. I thought it would be the easiest would be to serve um, donut holes. So the very first, um, let me just go over what we're going to be serving today. The very um, first thing we're going to serve is some chocolate donuts. You should have all gotten your um, handout. With a mascarpone frosting, I've fallen in love with my newfound friend, mascarpone. Um, it's delicious, delicious. I love it. A um, little lighter and fluffier than cream cheese. It is made with cream. And I actually, in, in just a little bit, I want to go ahead and get these going here so y'all can have something to eat. But um, I actually made my own, and it was very, very easy. I didn't put it in the handout because I just tried it yesterday to see if I could do it. And so I'll tell you how I did that. So we're going to do the chocolate donuts with the icing. Then we're going to, and this is breakfast, so 
This is everything chocolate. We're going to do breakfast, lunch, dinner, and dessert. So then we're going to do some chocolate nut waffles with a fresh raspberry sauce with um, uh, whipped cream. And then we're going to do, now this, is, this was an interesting one, but we all loved it. Chocolate cheese paninis. Grilled cheese sandwich with a layer of chocolate in there. Delish with an orange marmalade um, preserve uh, dressing to go on it. Then we're going to do um, some short ribs, some mocha. I can't remember the name of them, whatever they are called in your um, mocha braised short ribs. And, um, you know, I'm like, are they just looking for ways to put chocolate just to make this, you know, I got some of these ideas from a magazine. But I actually, when I was doing a lot of research on chocolate in Italy and Tuscany particularly, they're known for using chocolate to um, enhance the flavor of their savory dishes. It's not just used as a dessert um, item. It's delicious as a dessert item, and we all like that, but it, it does bring out the flavor. And you're going to love these short ribs. Very, very um just rich, rich, dark flavor. So we're going to do that. We're going to serve them today. Definitely you could put this over potatoes, mashed potatoes or noodles, but um, I'm going to serve them over polenta and I'm going to show you how to make a real creamy, creamy polenta. So we'll do that. Then I'm going to make for you, some of you maybe that have been coming for a while, the raw energy shake that I make with the maca and the cacao. We'll do that to kind of perk you up halfway, <laughs> halfway through. Then we're going to make our desserts for dinner. Um, we're going to do these chocolate crepes with the mascarpone um, filling and strawberries. And it's an orange mascarpone uh, filling and then strawberries. And we're going to top it with some almond whipped cream, um, which the flavors there are just absolutely delicious. And then we're going to make some butter toffee candy. And you're going to love making this. If you have gifts to give for Valentine's Day, you will want to do this. So easy, so absolutely delicious. Any Heath Bar fans? Um, oh my, so much better than that. And it's just so easy. Um, so we will do that. And I'm also for the dinner meal, which will be the short ribs. Um, I'm going to make for you um, a Valentine tea. It's a, it is a black tea and it has um, some natural hints of chocolate and strawberry in there. But I'm going to half and half it with our wild strawberry herbal tea. So I'm going to make an iced tea for you to have that as well. So let's get started and um your handout here i man i got carried away with all these facts about chocolate it real chocolate comes from um the pa paste of cacao seeds and this tree it's the theobroma um tree which is interesting because i had actually done some nutritional research on chocolate and found that it's one of the highest um content of theobromine and so that's actually where they why they called it that because it comes from chocolate and a lot of people talk about chocolate having caffeine it actually has theobromine I mean there is a mild little bit of caffeine there um, but the theobromine acts very much like caffeine except it's about 10 times weaker it is a stimulant but it doesn't give you the jitters it's actually almost relaxing um, it is a diuretic and so there's some it's all in your handout about the theobromine but um, I thought it was interesting and this is probably good for us ladies that the chocolate tree the 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 cacao tree actually produces fruit and flowers all year long. So, whew, that's good. So, there's probably no chance of a shortage there. But I, I thought I couldn't believe that um, it actually. I saw pictures of the fruit. To me, it almost looks like a butternut, not a butternut, uh, spaghetti squash. Have you seen it? It's the pods can be about five to twelve inches long and about five to um, three to five inches wide. And inside each pod, there's 20 to 40, I guess, depending on how big the pod, of these almond-shaped beans. And once they reach maturity, then that, that fruit actually turns brown, and that's how you know it's ripe. And so once they pick it, they'll remove those beans, and then that's when they, um, they said it's still kind of done like this, but in the old country, it was laid out on banana leaves and actually allowed to naturally ferment. Then they roast them and then they dry them and then they crack them open and there's actually what's inside those beans are the nibs. So this is your raw chocolate. This is your pure chocolate. These cannot be used like chocolate chips. I always get that, you know, they're not sweetened at all and they really don't have the intense chocolate flavor because what then, what will happen here is they'll begin to separate as they press this and turn it into a liquid liquor a chocolate liquor then they can take the cocoa butter off and then they 
um, so you have cocoa butter and um, and then the cacao or cacao, however you want to say it. So I've got you some terms here. You can read over that. Um, interesting, <clears throat> semi-sweet and bitter sweet chocolate um, usually have about 50 to 60 in your semi-sweet of your cacao content. And how pure your chocolate is, oftentimes, and now because cacao or cacao, some people say cacao, actually the pronunciation is supposed to be cacao here. Um, now, because it's so popular and, and there's a lot of, you know, how good chocolate is for you, um, it'll actually say on the bar now. And so your, um, your bittersweet typically has, can have as much as 85%. Usually it's your semi-sweet has about 50 to 60%. And then, of course, it'll have a little bit of, a little bit of sugar there. But you can pretty much interchange those anytime you have a recipe for um, dark chocolate. White chocolate isn't really chocolate at all. It doesn't have any of the, um, of the chocolate liqueur in it. What it does have in it is cocoa butter. But it, that's why it's, it's white, it, but it, it's not really, really chocolate if you wanted to get um, kind of crazy there. But, um, and then your cocoa powder is extracted from that liquor, um, that chocolate liquor, and then your cocoa butter goes off there and then your cocoa powder and um, I went in the grocery store yesterday on a hunt because years ago I would used to see the Dutch processed and um, and natural have you ever seen those terminology um, I don't know which brand is the Dutch processed. I couldn't find the Dutch processed anymore the Dutch process is treated um, with a um, an alkali to neutralize some of the acidity of your natural chocolate. Chocolate is naturally acidic. So um, you can't, so you typically will use um, the Dutch chocolate. Let me make sure I get this right. Um, it's in one of the hints here. Um, <clears throat> so in baking, it's possible to su substitute Dutch process for the natural, but you can't substitute the natural for the Dutch process. And I really haven't seen that many recipes now that call for the Dutch process. I wonder if it's just kind of gotten out of, out of style a little bit. So, but all that's in here, um, and you can, you can see that. If you ever have a recipe that calls for a square of baking chocolate and you don't have it around. I don't always have the squares of baking chocolate. I do have cocoa around usually all the time. You can substitute three tablespoons of cocoa powder with one tablespoon of butter and that's in your handout and that equals one one ounce square of your baking chocolate. Does that make sense? All right, well let's go ahead and we'll come back to some of these facts and trivia. Um, one, uh, oh, I do want to tell you this because of the tips because you may not read this whole handout. But have you ever tried to melt chocolate and had it turn kind of lumpy and grainy and you go like, I've melted these before, what's the problem? When melting chocolate, you cannot have even a drop of water in your utensils, on your stirring spoon or anything, or that's what causes it to go lumpy and grainy like that. So make sure your pot is completely dry, your stirring spoon is completely dry before you start um, melting your chocolate. I thought that was so interesting because I can't tell you how many times I'm like, I just melted, you know, at Christmas time when I'm baking or something, I just melted chocolate chips yesterday and now why won't these melt? So um, that's it. A simmer mat, by the way, is excellent if you're making chocolate. I don't know if you've ever used these. We sell these. These are great for things that are very easy to scorch, but you just put them um, flat side down on a regular stove glass top. You'll put point side down, but you just, and this is used on low to medium heat. This keeps, you can sit a pot here all day long. It won't scorch, won't dry out or anything. So this is a great tool if you do want to melt a lot of chocolate. Um, this, and you know, like for dipping and things like that. So it's really important. Um, to not let it scorch. Okay, well let's look at our donuts. If you want to turn to that recipe, um, this was such a huge success. Um, all I did for the dough was I took the basic bread dough in the Bread Becker's recipe collection, which most of you have it. Those of that are newcomers, it's six bucks. So you might want to just get our little six dollar recipe book. And all I did was the basic bread dough recipe in the very beginning. Um, I used all hard white wheat because I was going to add the chocolate and I didn't want the red to compete with that flavor. And all I did was add a third a cup of cocoa powder to the dough. And I just dumped one batch I dumped in in the water. You know, when you put your liquids all in, I mixed them in the bread machine. When you put your liquids in, I put one batch I did the, in the water and this morning I forgot 
in the first batch I did and I sprinkled it on top. I didn't notice a difference in the dough. So um, that's all I did for to make the dough. And now um, I'm going to, I'm letting my, um, I thought I'd do all donut holes for you today and I'm using our set of biscuit cutters. If, I'm, if you wanna do all holes, um, this is a perfect size just to do your donut holes. When I'm um, rolling the dough at home, I don't have a good um, donut cutter, so I have one that's left over from an old metal one that was my grandmother's. Do y'all remember these that had, yeah. Well, the donut, the, the outside part, biscuit cutter got all bent from using it so much over the years. So um, I love my biscuit cutters that we sell because they're just so nice and sturdy. Um, so now what I do for my, I take that second cutter and you want to roll your dough out to about, um, somewhere between a quarter and a half. Maybe a half might be too much, but a quarter might be too little. So somewhere there, because it is going to rise up. So you want it to be half of what you want your finished donut to be. And if you get your donuts too thick, then they won't get done on the inside. So you just roll the dough out, and I just rolled the whole batch of dough out. And now what I do at home, if I want to make donuts, I just cut that, and then I just come back with my little hole um, in the center, and that's how I make my donuts. My dough's drying out just a little bit. That one's a little bit, oh, it probably still works, so you can still use this one, but it made a perfect size on your donut holes. And what you wanna do when you're frying is what I do is I go ahead and, I use olive oil to fry with. Um, I love the way it fries, it just does a really nice job. Literature that I read years and years ago um, says there's perfectly great oil to fry with. In fact, it's one of the best. Um, it does have a high smoke point. A lot of literature out there now um, trying to sell you coconut oil, which I love coconut oil, saying, you know, you can't fry in olive oil. But that's not what I've read over the years, um, years ago before some of these other oils were popular. So um, what I usually do is um, once I get my donuts all cut and resting, then I heat my oil on high heat. And then once it's hot, then I'll adjust my, temp, my um, setting on my stove to maintain that high heat. Does that make sense? If you cook it on high the whole time, it'll just kind of keep getting hotter and hotter, and those last donuts will burn before the inside gets done. So that's the, the only tricky part really about frying donuts is to get that oil temperature just about right. And um, once, usually, like I said, once I fry that first batch, then I start kind of going down with it. And you'll see if that second batch gets brown too fast. Now, the hardest part about making chocolate donuts, you can't tell when they're brown. So <laughs> I just have to kind of look at them and think, well, okay. And so it was about a minute per side is what I found when I was cooking it. Because yeah, that's like I said, I started cooking, I'm like, well, how do I know that when these are done? Because the white, you know, dough, when you don't have chocolate in there, you can see them getting brown and you can see how the top kind of gets done. And um, I'm going to turn this on. It got really hot while I was talking. And um, maybe let you start um, frying while I make the icing. Making these at home, let me just tell you, don't try to do anything while you're frying donuts. You just got to, because you will burn them. They, they cook, they fry very, very quickly. Like I said, you may think a minute is a long time, but it, you know, don't turn around so, and do something else or answer the phone or blah, blah, blah. So um, you just want to, once you start frying, just stay on top of it. So I typically get everything ready. If we're having donuts with eggs and grits and other things, I get all of that ready, maybe my eggs ready to scramble, everything ready. And I make my icing before I start frying so that it, it's ready. Um, so I'm gonna, and one way I check the oil to see if it's hot enough, I don't know, yeah, you can see, is I'll drop um, a piece in there and you want it to really be, you can see it, really be frying. If it just kind of sinks and kind of lays there, it's not hot enough. So, and see, it's already popping up. So that's what you want, that's how you know um, the oil is ready. And I love, this one's a little big. I have a smaller pasta spoon at home. I really love it for getting the donuts. It's easy to, to flip the, um, the regular donuts. And then your donut holes, you kind of got to kind of stir almost to get them flipped because they like to flip back on that um, cooking side. But so that is that. I'm going to let Ashley um, go ahead and be frying these while we make the icing. So she, and you can just fill them up. 
Um, usually in, in a pot this size, I can usually do four or five donuts at a time. I'll do like four around the, the edge and then one in the middle of, of my big donuts. And then I fry all my holes at the end. One basic recipe makes about 24 donuts, so about two dozen. Um, last time I made it, made 23, but somewhere right around there. So that's kind of the thickness you want. And totally fine to just pick, you know, once you get your donuts cut, then pick up the dough and roll it out, you know, kind of push it back together and roll it out again and cut donuts with those, okay? So um, I'm going to let Ashley fry and just, yeah. So now what she's wanting to do, see how they're kind of fluffed up, uh, popped up, just let them cook for about 30, 45 seconds, and then just kind of stir them with that spoon to try to get them flipped over, and then drain them. I drain them on paper towels. And then let them cool just enough to touch before you um, ice them. I do. I do. Y'all might, yeah, I do. Uh, let me, I'm missing my... And a Southern Girl's best friend is a mason jar. And um, that's what I use. That's what I put my fry oil yeah. in. And I just keep it. Yeah, I do. Until um, it starts, you know, until it gets, you know, too dirty or whatever, then I start. Yeah, if I, start or, with fry. yeah, if I've, like, if I've fried, I don't fry a lot of things. Donuts are about the main thing every now and then, like sweet potato fries or something like that. I don't fry, uh, repeat the question. Yes, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> um, do I save my oil? The answer is yes. Um, I store mine in a mason jar. She learned it well. Um, so anyway, um, we keep all the good stuff in a mason jar. <laughs> yeah, all our money, all our everything. But anyway, um, so yeah, if I do fry something that's breaded, you know, and it gets a lot of crumbs in the bottom, that'll start tasting burned. So either strain that off. If I've only used it once, I'll just strain that off. So if you do have a little residue, and if I've fried fish, which I never fry fish, but um, I don't ever save that oil because then things will taste like that. Okay, let's make our icing while Ashley's frying the donuts. But like I said, normally I'd get everything ready before I start frying. And um, as cool as it is this morning, I probably could have put these, um, I will spray uh, like a, a cookie sheet um, so that, that it doesn't stick. This dough's a little stiff because of adding the extra cocoa in there. And honestly, this morning, I can't remember if I took some of the flour out, you know, replaced it with a third of a cup. I think I probably did. Do you know what I'm saying? That basic recipe calls for four and a half cups of flour. I probably should have removed some because this is a little stiff. So I hope the donuts aren't going to be too heavy, but we're going to coat them with chocolate icing. Who cares? So, you know, really. <laughs> so you will love the icing. This icing is amazing. I, most of the time when I make icing, now usually with a glaze for donuts, I'll do just where I melt a little butter, just stir in um, some powdered honey granules, which by the way, I want to powder honey granules. Uh, I couldn't find my bucket of honey granules. Hang on. Oh, right here with honey granules on the top. We do sell powdered honey granules, and I find that they are um, a little finer than what I can get with a blender. But um, if you want to just have your honey granules and powder them, the best way to do that is with a blender. So I will powder some for you and show you how to do that. And then, um, I'm having trouble seeing things today. And then I will, but I'm going to use the powdered honey granules already. Now you'll never get powdered sugar, okay? So when I, so when it's called powdered honey granules, they're a little, it's a little grainy. I'll pass some around so you can see. And I have found with, when am I on? When I do icing with the powder, whether I powder my own or use the powdered honey granules, when you mix it in with your butter and your cream cheese or whatever it is that you're making your icing with, let it sit, stir it up yep. really good, and then let it sit five or ten minutes and let it completely dissolve and then stir it in, stir it up again. Which is the main reason I was going to make this icing in the class. I just wanted you to see that, yes, just whip it in. It's not going to be like powdered sugar that just dissolves easily. The the honey granules take a little more effort to dissolve, so just I whip it, and it'll look fluffy, and then I just let it sit, and then right before I ice the, I might, that's one thing you could do, is turn your, however you're whipping it, let it, and whip it again, and then maybe just two or three times in the course of 10 or 15 minutes. So um, that's what I have found. Okay, I found I can do easily about a cup at a time in my big blender, about a half a cup of time, in my little Tribest personal blender, and it works great. 
I think I just dropped my my cover. And this, of course, is our Anka Shroom um, original assistant, fabulous, fabulous mixer. So we just powder it. And this just really helps it to just go into, go into, um, you know, mix in a little better and make a little fluffier icing. So there's my powdered honey granules. Actually, it looks pretty powdery with this. Um, so now we'll make our icing, and I've softened my um, butter. One thing you do want to remember, you absolutely, okay, I keep losing my, Hang on. I just got one out, and I had one out already, so I'm running out. Good thing I have, like, Can you three tell she hasn't taught a class in a while? Slacker's been out of town. Um, I went 1,500 miles in five days and did three speaking engagements. Slacker. I taught three classes in eight days. Beat that. What? <laughs> oh, well, here's why I can't find them. They're all in here. Yay. Well, I think I need some chocolate. <laughs> that will make everything better. Okay, so if y'all want to turn to your icing recipe is here. It's a half a stick of butter. And this is actually a very, very, I mean, I'm sorry, a half a cup, which is one stick. This is a very, very fluffy icing. This would work great, beautifully for cupcakes and things like that. Um, I, I'm falling in love with it. And I've always been a cream cheese kind of icing person for cakes and things like that. So much better that I love this. Um, it's just a little lighter in flavor, a little fluffier. Um, you can get this in the deli section of the grocery store. I will tell you how to make it here shortly. Okay, this calls for four ounces, so that's a half of the package. And then this is my lovely um, double whisk, whisk whipping bowl that comes with the Anka Shroom. So um, I'm just going to turn my beater bowl, my beaters on, and let it whip until it's creamy. And honestly, it says about four and a half cups of, um, of the honey granules. So I'm going to just go ahead. I didn't measure. I just started adding until it looked like what I wanted it to look like. And then you're going to put your cocoa powder in. I think I was supposed to put that in and then start adding it in. But it really, really doesn't matter. I'm going to add my vanilla. Two teaspoons. That looks right. And then let's just whip that up. Woo! Turn that down. I like chocolate. Whoop! but I'm going to be tasting like it today. Add your milk. <laughs> All right, you better quit laughing. <laughs> okay, I do scrape the bowl down just a tad because some of the, the cream and the butter just kind of get on that edge there. All right, so now I'll get my powdered honey granules, and I'll keep adding until it looks right. This reminds me of the blender story. Uh, be quiet, please. <laughs> we are not discussing the blender story today. But um, we had one of one of our <laughs> participants has a great um, picture of the. How many of y'all were at the Christmas class? has a great picture of me in the onion goggles. Oh, is it ever becoming? So maybe I'll post that today so that um, y'all can see me in all my finery. And go, okay, if she can do this, I think I can, because she is crazy. And for the answer to crazy is chocolate. Trivia. Did y'all see my trivia post? How many of y'all follow me on Facebook? Um, for the movie Psycho, how many of y'all remember Alfred Hitchcock, the e e e, the shower scene? Yes, they used chocolate syrup for that. And I, I was telling Jim, my partner, I was like, I don't know how they made it red. And he goes, that was black and white. That was before color, so they didn't have to make it red. So it, 
explode. So next thing you think of blood, chocolate syrup. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, so now we'll just add this. Just continue to whip. And like I said, it'll look a little grainy, but just um, never fear. It'll start getting fluffy. See how it, can you see how it's looking fluffy now? And honestly, um, for donuts, I, you typically want the um, icing a little bit thinner than this. So I'm just gonna go ahead and add a little bit more milk to thin it just slightly. But you're gonna love having this icing on hand. And I actually made some the other day. I'm gonna add to this and um, so that it'll cream it, fluff it back up. So there's, and you can't tell, but there was all kinds of nice smooth, like spoon marks off the top of uh, that icing. I could tell, I'm like, hmm, yeah. somebody's been tasting this. Tasting it? Or like yeah. I had it for lunch. Yeah. <laughs> it was one of those weeks last week. I even wondered if this would be good spread on the panini. Uh, maybe so, might be, yeah. So, all right, so. And I, all I'm doing is just adding that to fluff it back up a little bit. You wouldn't have to. And like I said, this is a little thicker than I normally use for donut icing. Usually I just do the, the glaze almost. Like I do a couple of tablespoons of butter, about a cup and a half, two cups of the honey granules, whip it up, add a little teaspoon of vanilla, and then milk until it's just a runny consistency. And then that'll harden more like a glaze. But you're going to love this icing. Um, probably, um, no, that'll be fine. Y'all can just dip out as you need it. Now, see, I don't know if you can tell from the overhead, but it's looking fluffier now. And what I usually do, and this is the hard part about this job, is I take um, a spoon and I taste it to see if it's grainy. It's just a tiny, tiny bit grainy, so I'm going to just let it sit for just a few minutes and then we'll whip it and it'll be perfect. Of course, it'll melt on the donuts just fine. So, um, yeah. And um, that's it on the donuts, yes. Um, with, the, with the honey granules, do you use those in your peanut butter bar recipe? Absolutely. Um, a lot of people, um, the question is, can you use those in your peanut butter bars or your brownies, the powdered honey granules? Yes, in fact, my son, or is it you too, do you like to powder your honey granules before you make your brownies? They find that it makes just a little finer, nicer texture. I find that it kind of melts, but yes, you can certainly use the powdered honey granules. Um, do not powder your sucanot, sucanot with honey, in your grain mill. Do not put this in your grain mill. Do not think, wow, I could probably do a lot if I ran this through my grain mill. <gasps> no, you will ruin your grain mill, okay? Um, you just really don't want to do that. Grain mill is for grain and beans, flour. This is not, and you're thinking, oh, but it's powdery and it probably do, no, don't, okay? Did y'all hear me? Repeat after me. Do not put honey granules or sucanot in your grain mill. Do not, X, 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 no. Blender, blender works great. You saw how easy that was, just really, really works fine. Pardon me? Yeah, um, I use, uh, this one will do about a cup at a time. My big one that I have, well, I can do a cup or two cups. The little um, Tribest blender cup, um, really about a half a cup at a time, okay? So when I'm making my glaze for like cinnamon rolls and vanilla glaze for icing, uh, I mean for donuts regularly, I'll do it in here because I only use about a cup of it. And I just whip it with a fork, you know, in a little bowl. So does that make sense? All right, now that I have um, cacao powder, and I actually used our raw cacao powder for this. Since it wasn't going to be cooked, I thought, why not get the goodness of the raw chocolate? Um, while we're finishing frying here, I'm going to whip this up one time. Let me just tell you a little bit of the nutritional benefits of chocolate. Really, really does have nutritional benefits. Of course, not the Snickers bar, or I shouldn't probably say name brands, but not the candy bar junkies that are out there in the store. In fact, most of us chocolate kind of 
brings a guilty pleasure indulgence that we really probably should try to do without. Not so real chocolate. In fact, of all the foods tested, real chocolate, cacao, has the highest antioxidant content. Pretty fascinating, huh? And um, so it, but it needs to be as close to the way God created as possible, just like any other food. So the heavily processed um, candy bars and things like that out there, honestly, they have, don't have nearly as much chocolate in them as you think. And then all the sugar and all the fat and all the artificial sweetener and all the other junk that they put in there kind of detracts from the nutritional benefits. Um, also, it's one of the richest food sources in, of magnesium. How many of you crave chocolate certain times of the month? The reason is that calcium and magnesium work together to help prevent cramps, um, the contraction and relaxation of your muscles. Um, your calcium is more at the front end. We usually think of it as a relaxant, and it is because it goes hand in hand with magnesium, but it's kind of the front end and magnesium is the back end. So it, it takes both to contract and relax. So during your cycle, when your body is contracting, you start using a lot of calcium magnesium to prevent that. Well, if you're not getting enough calcium magnesium, then you're gonna have severe cramps. And um, it's been proven that a magnesium deficiency is usually, um, I mean, a chocolate craving is usually an indication of a magnesium deficiency. So you could just take some magnesium. There's products out there, you know, that are uh, handy for doing that and having those times a month or calcium magnesium at night. Um, but most of us have already reached for the chocolate bar <laughs> before we think about magnesium. But, um, and studies are showing that about 80% of Americans are magnesium deficient. We're getting the calcium we need, but we're not getting the magnesium to help us use that calcium. So I thought that was some interesting um, info. Okay, um, we're going to start uh, one more time. We'll whip the icing. See how fluffy and pretty that is? Wow, that looks good. And like I said, you, I typically do a little thinner icing for my donuts. It's more like a glaze. Wow, we shouldn't waste that, should we? I am, no. I am gonna sit it here. <laughs> I am not going to lick that in front of y'all. Very tempted, but the onion goggles were bad enough. But um, anyway. Okay, so, and now we'll just dip it in there and it'll give a little more like an icing, more like you may see, um, one of my children said it tasted just like, <laughs> just like a Dunkin' Donut. You can taste those. All right, so now I'm going to just set this aside to cool. Definitely let it cool before you pack it up. Actually, I'm going to put it over here on this metal table. And again, like I said, the hardest part of the uh, chocolate donuts is knowing when they're done. All right, let's clean this up here. Any questions? Any more trivia? You want to hear some more trivia? World War II, 1940. M&Ms were invented for the soldiers to take to the war. How about that? Didn't know that. Didn't know that. Um, need a wash rag. Do y'all have my wash rag? Yep. Abby, throw me that brown wash rag, please. Thank you. And chocolate actually has um, numerous neurotransmitters, um, which in uh, neurotransmitters uh, such as serotonin, you've all heard of serotonin, right? That helps you kind of sleep. Um, endorphins, dopamine, um, but one, uh, it's called phenylethylamine, P-E-A. Chocolate is one of the richest sources of that. And that is the neurotransmitter, the chemical, the phytochemical that's released with your, in your body when you fall in love. And it's that same kind of when you feel loved, you tend to release that P-E-A. And it's in chocolate. So I kind of, when I read that, I was like, 
wow, I wonder if that's why we do chocolate at Valentine. You know, that's kind of, I'm going to give you chocolates for the girl that you love or the boy that you love or whatever. We well, usually boys get it for girls because boys want bag of chips. So just, that's easy. They're so easy. Just get them a bag of chips and they'll be happy with us. It's chocolate. Chocolate. So. I've always thought do that men are more like dogs. I'm probably fixing to get myself in big trouble. Men are more like dogs and women are like kittens. I mean, or cats. Have you ever thought about that? I mean, do guys are like, huh, huh, yeah, you want to do it? Yeah, right, right here. Hoo, hoo. And they like to be touched and felt. And cats are like, yeah, I can take it tonight. Maybe. Yeah, scratch me. Oh, nope, I'm done. I've had enough. Give me, <laughs> give me some chocolate. going there I was just talking about in general all right whatever y'all are terrible yes that I burst that I burst all right let's get rid of this guy and we are going to pull up my waffle maker our chirping waffle maker. I love this waffle maker. This is our Caccini Pro waffle maker. It chirps when it's heated up and it chirps when the waffle is ready. How do we know? I do not know. So, but anyway, so we're going to get this going. And um, the donuts were made with hard white wheat. Like I said, I didn't want the, the um, competition of flavor with the red wheat. You certainly could use red if you wanted to. Um, but I find when I'm adding... Um, flavorings and things like that to my dough. I typically use white wheat. For the waffles, I'm going to use sorghum this morning. Sorghum is a gluten-free grain, and that's not necessarily why I'm using it. But although um, anytime you're you're using a recipe that doesn't have yeast, so your muffins, pancakes, waffles, it's very easy to substitute just about any type of grain flour you want. So um, I substituted sorghum here. Sorghum is an ancient grain. Unfortunately, in this country, it's mostly um, livestock feed, but it's a very, just kind of like millet. We're feeding it to the birds, and sorghum is a very, very, very nutritious grain. It has a, the plus of being gluten-free. A lot of people are concerned about gluten these days. Very high in iron, very high in protein. Um, got your B vitamins there. Just very, very nutritious grain. Yes, you had a question? Sorghum syrup isn't different. This is grain sorghum. Sorghum syrup comes from something called a sweet sorghum. And that they take the, the plant itself and press it and get um, the syrup out of it. Very good question. Did I repeat the question? How do they get, how do they get um, syrup out of sorghum? It's a different plant. This is grain sorghum. That's called sweet sorghum. And they'll, it's, it's a variety. I think they still can get the seeds from it. I can't totally remember now. But they use the plant and everything. When I was reading how they get syrup from the sweet sorghum, it almost made me think of um, how they get agave nectar. They use the whole plant and press the, the syrup, the sugar out, the carbohydrate out. Somebody, okay, okay, yes. Yes, the question is, can you use sorghum um, for the soft white? Um, when you're making cookies and things. I absolutely, um, I used it, I just wanted to try. When I tried this recipe, it's fluffy, it's nice, it's soft, it's not gritty. Now I'm gonna add pecans in there. So if you feel, I'm gonna put the ground pecans. So if you feel the grit, it's coming more from the pecans and not the sorghum. So absolutely, if it's not a yeast bread dough, you can really substitute these flours. Rice flour is a little dry. Whereas, look how, I mean, the sorghum, it's very fluffy. It's very, very nice. So I think you're going to love having this and just, you know, being able to change up your grains a little bit. All right, let's get our batter here for our, our waffles. And I am doubling this recipe, so don't be alarmed when you see me adding some extra stuff here. So, um, oh, I need that burner back up here for a minute. Let me get rid of this. Because um, I actually thought with the chocolate, I was thinking that coconut would be oil instead of olive oil would be a nice complement here, and I loved it. So um, 
we're going to use the coconut oil. So I just need to melt it just a little bit. Hey, uh, here's this if you need to dip more. How are they? Did they? Oh, don't lie now. Y'all be careful. Chocolate's in the house. You got to be honest. Okay. So I'm going to just turn my burner on here on very low. The melting point of um, coconut oil is like 78 degrees, so it really doesn't take um, a lot of heat here. So I'm just going to, um, and this is, whoo, this is hardened. So I'm just going to, I already measured this yesterday, but you could just, um, put what you think is and then liquefy it and then measure but I already liquefied and measured it and put it back in here so that is it calls for a half a cup so that's my cup of coconut oil and then I'm going to melt my chocolate chips in with it right So I'm going to take my chocolate chips. These are our Enjoy Life chocolate chips. They're gluten-free, dairy-free. Um, they're made with only the chocolate liqueur. So, and you've got your evaporated cane juice as your sweetener and your non-dairy cocoa butter. Okay, so that's our Enjoy Life chocolate chips. So if you wanted to make this gluten-free, dairy-free, you could use an alternate milk. But I'm going to just use my um, organic whole milk here. So in a medium bowl, I'm going to put my flour. You could totally use powdered honey granules here if you wanted to, but I'm just going to use my regular honey granules, my baking powder, and my salt. Okay. And my wire whisk. And this is a basic way to mix up any type of pancake batter. Do your dry ingredients first. Make a well in the center. Set that aside. Got my coconut oil melting here. I'm just going to give that a little stir and get that ready. Something tells me I didn't quite plan out all my utensils very well so I'm going to just set that aside for just a minute it'll stay melted I'm going to move my burner and put oh uh, you know what I need the double whisk bowl I typically have more than one and for some reason I only have one up here Maggie can you get that bowl and if I have one in the kitchen that would be great I don't know why I only have one in my cabinet Oh, nope, never mind, I got another one. Yahoo! And I know I got these. So this is the double whisk whisking bowl. You just put the post there, put this here, let it drop into place, and put your whippers there. And now it calls for separating my eggs into a separate small bowl. Yeah, but I keep forgetting that I'm doing more so actually I'm going to separate my eggs I so wanted to try the bottle method <laughs> Ashley saw a um, method for separating your egg yolks from your egg whites on was it YouTube or yeah. something where you take a empty water bottle you know like you after you've drank the water out of it and you just crack the egg into a bowl and then you just squeeze it and put it right down on the yolk and it just sucks the yolk right up into the bottle. <laughs> and then you just, then you move the bottle over and just squeeze it and it shoots it out whole. So I haven't tried it and I'm not going to try it without trying it. Been known to do some things like that, but not today. But every time I do this in a class, I think, man, I wish I had remembered to try that bottle. And of course you could, you can, some people separate their eggs by, um, going back and forth in the shell, but I just do them this way. Some people do it like that, but to me it's just, whoop, come here. There we go. All right, so now I'm gonna dump my egg whites into here. 
and I'm going to whip my egg whites after I wash my hands. Do any of y'all have that cool contraption that hangs on your bowl? It looks like a whisk or whatever. Yeah. Had no idea what that was. Got it as a wedding present. Didn't use it for like 10 years. And then I was like, oh, that's what that is. All right. So now I'm going to, while that's whipping, I'm going to beat my yolks. I so hope that bowl is going to hold a double recipe. I'm not sure if it's going to. My milk and my vanilla. Okay, so got that whisk together. Now, so while that's whipping, whoops, which it's whipped. Hello. I'm turning the wrong way. All right, so you want stiff egg whites. So what you want to see is when you lift the beater out, you want it to form kind of peaks and come with it. So that's, that's good there. See how versatile this mixer is. Does all sorts of good things for you. All right, so now I'm going to add my melted chocolate gradually to my egg mixture. Okay, so got that. And now I'm going to add the whole egg uh, mixture here to my batter. Always make a well in the center and pour your liquids right into the middle all at once and just stir. It's going to be a little lumpy. That's okay. Anybody have nut allergies? Are y'all okay with pecans? Okay. Well, I'm just having issues today. Okay. Sorghum tends to absorb some extra water or a good bit more moisture than wheat. So even though this looks a little runny, it will um, actually absorb some extra liquid as it sits here. Okay, so I'm going to let that sit there, and then I'm going to stir in my nuts, but I'm going to slightly grind them because I don't want them so whole. So again, I will use my little tri-best for that. This is my little personal tri-best personal blender. I'll do half my nuts at a time. Well, with a single recipe, you could do them all at once, but since I'm doubling this, I just want them a little finer than this so that it'll cook a little nicer in the waffle maker. So all you do is just put it in your cup, put your lid on. The nice thing about this is you can pick it up and shake it <laughs> so it gets all of it ground. There we go. So that's part of my nuts. I'm just going to stir that in. I'll do my other half. And then I'll let Ashley start cooking these, and then we'll make the raspberry salt, um, syrup to go over it. Uh-huh. I used it one for one, the sorghum flour. I used it one for one. I didn't find, if you, if you find, I mean, you can always thin a batter. 
you it's you know so um, I didn't find that it really needed the extra liquid I found that it did just fine one for one so her question was with the sorghum flour did I need extra flour or less flour no I just did it exactly as the recipe called for but can you see how much thicker the, the, dough, the batter is than when I first started so I'm just gonna stir in my nuts do you have this heating yeah Okay, and you really do not want to stir a pancake batter just to death. So you don't need a mixer to do this. You just want to stir it in. It is going to be a little lumpy. Just keep it kind of gentle. And now, whoops, we'll fold in our egg whites. Fold in about half at a time. And this really helps make your whole grain um, pancakes and waffles just a little fluffier. My original pancake recipe, I think it's still written that way in my book, is to fold in the egg whites. Um, I got lazy over the years and just quit doing it. When I do it, my kids go, wow, what'd you do to the pancakes? They're so much lighter and fluffier. It does make a difference. And you, again, you don't want to like whisk these in. You want to just fold them in. So you just kind of fold by pulling towards you. Yes, pulling towards you. Will be kind of lumpy and then just add the rest. You do a half at a time because it'd be a little too much to work with if you were doing it all at once. Whoops, sorry. So there's our waffle batter. And I typically don't make my, um, my uh, waffle or pancake batter, I don't usually put sweetener in there, but with the cocoa in this, you know, adding a, a sharpness and a bitterness to it you really do need um, the little bit extra sweetener and my um, my syrup or my the raspberry sauce that I'm going to put over it is not nearly as sweet as syrup would be could certainly serve this with strawberry syrup the agave syrups were really really nice so anything like that but um, we we love um, typically how I serve pancakes at home is with strawberries and whipped cream rarely do we eat syrup um, one of my sons likes creating masterpieces, so he does the strawberries, the whipped cream, and then takes the syrup and drizzles across like that. But the rest of us typically just do the strawberries and whipped cream. So our waffle maker is chirping. Do you hear it? <laughs> it's ready to take the first batch of um, waffle batter. And that you was do. Actually the other one that did that. Oh, well, that's what I was thinking. Why is this one not chirping? This one's not chirping, is it? It hasn't. Yeah, well, you want to bring the other one over here? We'll use it because I didn't know why we had two. I didn't remember taking two out. We have two because of the Getting Started class. Ah, yeah, that would be make sense. Well, I figured I'd get it ready because we we're going to need both yeah, of them. Yeah, both to cook of them over them anyway. there. Mm -hmm. All right, so while she's cooking that, um, and you do about a cup and a cup and a quarter of um, the batter. You have that one? Okay. And then you just um, spread it. Uh, hang on. I lightly, oh, well, go ahead. I think I, I lightly spray my um, waffle maker, the first bath, first waffle I cook each time I do it, um, just to make sure it doesn't stick as much. So now we're going to cook that there, and I need my blender. And I need the lid, there it is. All right, so now we're going to make our raspberry sauce to go on it. And like I said, totally you could do um, strawberries or just syrup or whatever you want. But I really did. I made this raspberry sauce back over the holidays, and I really, really loved it. So I just thought we'll do it with these waffles. Now, you can use um, frozen strawberries. In fact, I think the original recipe that I got the idea from did use frozen. I always love to do fresh. Um, if the raspberries aren't on sale particularly and these were really pretty <laughs> um, but I did price check yesterday or the day before when I was buying everything and definitely the frozen berries are the cheaper way to go <laughs> because they were like um, I think four dollars for a 12 ounce um, container and these were like four dollars for a six ounce you know container so um, sometimes they're on sale and that's that's a you know you can get a good price on them but um, 
So, but I had already bought them by the time I checked. So now we're, so we've got our blender with the um, 12 ounces of raspberries. If you use frozen, you want to thaw them out before you uh, use them. They don't have to be completely thawed, but you definitely want to get them thawed. So now we're going to do some orange juice. You could do, you know, stuff if you have it in the freezer. I don't have orange juice in the freezer. I typically do have oranges around the house. So um, I do the fresh squeezed. And I've found about two oranges make whatever it calls for here in the <laughs> recipe, a fourth of a cup. So I will do my oranges. The handy squeezer is really nice. This mixer also has a citrus juice attachment. If you were going to do a lot of citrus um, juicing, you could certainly use that. But just for this recipe, um, I was like, I'm doubling this, but not the syrup. I already made a batch of the syrup. This squeezes your juice and the holes are not big enough that it lets it keeps the seeds out. They're small enough they keep the seeds out. How much orange juice did it say? Quarter of a cup. Okay. Yep, it's gonna take both of them. Yes, ma'am. It's about two. Um, actually I'm getting pretty close to the quarter of a cup here with just the one and a half. Alright, I'm gonna leave this sitting here for you to do your thing, and I'm just going to go over there and start okay, cooking. Okay, start all cooking. Of them. Sounds great. So now there's my quarter cup of orange juice. And then I need four tablespoons of agave syrup. I love my little minis for measuring my tablespoons and things like that. I actually found it needed just a little bit more syrup it wasn't quite sweet enough to me again I think it'll be depend on your berries how sweet your berries are so I'm actually putting about five tablespoons if you want to make that note but just taste it and if it's you know sweet enough for your family but I found that my kids um, preferred it just a tad bit sweeter I have a lemon squeezer but since I've already got the orange squeezer out it will work just fine and I think it takes only a half of a lemon to get my whatever it calls for two yeah half of, li of a, it's a very large lemon that's two tablespoons oh it calls for three okay so we'll just do another one okay so there's that and then um you can if you don't like the seeds in this some people kids are really weird we are we don't mind the seeds at all. In fact, Abigail's very picky. She likes raspberry jelly with seeds in it. So that's my child. Um, but anyway, some kids don't. So you can totally strain this if you want through a fine mesh strainer. I like the seeds. So we're having seeds today. See how pretty that is? Doesn't matter if there's a few little lumps still in there. I don't know why all they get missed. So there's our raspberry sauce. And now we're going to make our whipped cream. Okay. Any questions so far? Y'all good with this? So this is the sorghum nut. Um, you can use walnuts here if you want, pecans, whatever, whatever you want. It's your waffles. You can do with it whatever you want. The waffle sheriff is not going to come check on you. We'll be too busy eating chocolate. Uh huh. To the batter. Mm hmm. The 
egg yolks. The egg yolks, I separated the eggs and had the egg yolks and the milk and the vanilla or whatever it was, and we chocolate. and the chocolate and the coconut oil, we mixed in. Then we dumped all of that into the batter. The egg whites we whipped into stiff egg whites and then I folded that in. Yeah, is that what it says? Yeah, you, you good there? Okay, yeah, you sure? Yeah. See me after class. <laughs> yeah, see me, okay. Oh, that looked white, so that's what, yeah, that was the coconut oil and the chocolate chips that we melted just ever so slightly and then stirred into the egg yolks, the milk, and the vanilla. And then it was the egg whites, then we folded in at the end. And like I said, in a pinch, you could just skip the egg whites part, but it does tend to make a little fluffier waffle. You'll see how tall and nice the, the waffles are. Okay, let's get our whipping cream. I do um, buy organic on the cream. I'm a little picky about um, my, my milk and cream. Your toxins are held in your fat cells, so when it comes to cream and butter, I'm going organic. And I know sometimes the butter costs twice as much, but I'm just going organic there. And I think, I think in the long run, I think you, it's just healthier and you'll, it, it weighs itself out, you know, that you may spend a little bit more here and there, but the long run it'll, all right, balance out. So these are our wonderful whipped cream makers. We're gonna do, um, I'm just gonna do vanilla whipped cream. I thought of doing orange and almond and I thought we'll just do the vanilla today with the waffles because we're gonna do almond whipped cream with the, um, with the crepes in just a little bit. Whoop, sorry. sorry. We're confiscating. Oh, hang on, hang on. Okay, go ahead, just give me, a, just give me one. Yeah, just a quarter. That'll be fine. You need them? Yeah. Okay. That's plenty, actually, is what I... All right. So now we just put... Make sure your little gasket's in the lid. And we're going to add... Sorry. Sorry. Two tablespoons of agave nectar. That actually had a little bit of vanilla left in there from something else, but I'll add just a tiny touch more. I do about a teaspoon. You can see really, really carefully measure all this. It's very, very important. And now, I, so you put your lid on, and all I do is give it just a little shake just to get that sweetener that's heavier than your cream off the bottom. Particularly if you use honey, you really want to give it a couple of shakes to get that honey. But that's why I love a get the honey off the bottom, not finishing my sentence. That's why I love agave nectar for sweetening my cream because it mixes in just, it doesn't get hard when it, when you put it in the cold cream, whereas your honey just gets harder. And you'll find that the last bit of your cream is a lot sweeter than the top part. So now all we do to make our whipped cream going to take our um, cartridge, our gas cartridge, put it there, screw it on. It pressurizes the tank and then we shake it up and you have whipped cream, ready whip. Take your cartridge off once you get it, once it's pressurized, it's done its job, you put your little nozzle on, just snaps into place. So now we're going to put our little strawberry, I mean our raspberry glaze or syrup on our waffle. We're going to top it with some whipped cream, real whipped cream. And then Abby came up with this great idea. You can garnish it. The first time I made it, I garnished it with extra nuts and chocolate chips. You can certainly do that. But um, she took, um, Abby, where's the package? Okay, she took our hot chocolate mix that we sell and it's actually a, it's a non-dairy, it's a coconut base, coconut milk base, so it's got a little hint of coconut flavor. And I tossed it in the Insta Blend. Oh, it's not non-dairy, I'm sorry, I thought it was. Okay, so it's not non-dairy. And it clumped up a little bit, so she put it in the Insta Blend to make it powdery and then these are our little um, pump and spice uh, little dispensers to give you your nice garnish on top. So that's gonna be a little hint of your coconut flavored hot chocolate mix or your coconut based hot chocolate mix. We sell this. It's a powder. So um, there you go. So there's your strawberries. 
your chocolate nut sorghum waffle with your raspberry sauce and real whipped cream and a little garnish of the hot chocolate mix. All right, who wants this one? Here you go. Can she have this one or did yeah. you need it? Allison can have anything she wants. Oh, <laughs> okay. So, all right. Everybody good with that so far? And here's more raspberry. Here's that. Whoop. Okay. Moving right along. Oh, Abby, you want the whipped cream? I love the whipped cream makers. Here's the deal. Once you whip that till it's gone, it's, um, but it will stay in the refrigerator unless you use it up before that two to three weeks, which is very unlike if you whip whipping cream, you know, because the blender will do it. The double whisk bowl will do a nice job, but then your leftovers, mine always would go in a bowl and we would forget about it. And then I would throw away spoiled whipping cream. Now with that, we don't forget about it. We see it. It's right there and the kids take it out. They put it on their hot chocolate. They put it in their coffee. They put it whatever. Um, so I love having the whipped cream maker around. I find it actually is very cost effective. And then of course I can do all kinds of flavors. Vanilla, orange, uh, almond, whatever um, you want with the with the whipped cream, you can flavor it however you want. Yep. So one time use the on the on the whipped cream maker, the cartridge is a one time use. Okay, because you puncture it. Where'd it go? I think I threw it away. Um, Yes, mm -hmm. they come, we have 10 packs or we have 24 packs. It's certainly cheaper, you know, but just remember it does a pint. So when you're going to do it, go ahead and do the whole pint. It'll do a half a pint in there if you want, but go ahead and do the whole pint. Keeps for weeks. As long as you keep it really cold, don't just let it sit on the table for hours and hours and then, you know, it, it you know, use it for sure. You don't have to go, oh, I got to get this back in the refrigerator, but just, you know, but so it's a one-time use. It punctures. All the gas goes into the container to pressurize it and whips it instantly. So I love it. Absolutely love it. Yes. That my recipe was for a pint. The, the one that's in your handout there is for a pint. Okay. All right. Um, These that are already done, yes. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah. All the ones that are done. Um, they keep a, a while in the refrigerator or the freezer. If I were going to make a batch, I'd probably go ahead and just stick them in the freezer. Go ahead, lay them out um, single layer on your waffles because if you stack them, they're going to get soggy. You know, they're going to sweat on each other and get soggy. So always lay your um, waffles out single layer. These in particular seem to toast up very well, um, you know, reheated. My children, I have, I'm sorry, they're, they're very snobby. They will not eat leftover pancakes. They will not eat leftover waffles. I have to make them fresh. They're just used to it because in our family, with that many kids, there was, that's why I'm sorry my recipes are so big in my book, like, you know, the pancake recipe. I now have to cut in half the pancake recipe, and we still have leftover pancakes with just the three kids and myself. Brad's very rarely there when and they don't get up for breakfast till about 11. So um, in my my Latvian son is so much like my son David who counts how many meals you have. So he goes, okay, is this lunch? Or no, he goes, so what are we having for lunch? And I'm like, this is lunch. No, this is breakfast. No, it's 1130. You know, by the time we finish eating, sometimes it's quarter to 12. I'm like, no, this is, this is lunch. And he's like, but we didn't have breakfast. I'm like, well, we're having breakfast and lunch at the same time. So, <laughs> and he's like, but, but, and I'm like, You'll be fine. I promise you won't be hungry before dinner time. So you'll be all right. So anyway, but he's, he's kind of counting his meals there with me. All right. I think I can move this aside now for just a little while. Um, we're going to move on to, actually, we're going to go ahead and get our dinner started because the short ribs take about 45 minutes to cook in the pressure cooker. Without a pressure cooker, you need to cook short ribs for anywhere from three to three and a half hours. And the recipe... Um, that I took this idea from actually had you sear them and brown everything and then put it in a baking dish and bake it in the oven for three to three and a half hours. So you can do that, but a pressure cooker cooks them fall off the bone tender in 40, 45 minutes. So um, we're going to cook them in the pressure cooker. 
so if you want to, we're going to skip the paninis right now. We'll come back to that because we really need to get the um, short ribs cooking. And then we'll come back for the paninis. And I kind of thought that they would be over there frantically making waffles. So instead of dumping paninis on them now to have to cook and, and slice, we go ahead and get the short ribs going. All right, so I'm going to use an 8-liter pressure cooker. These are the Fissler pressure cookers. They're newly designed. The old ones are, are still great, so don't feel like you have to buy a new one because they newly designed them. But they did um, add some features that are really, really nice. The one hand closure and the automatic um, locking handle. And these handles will detach very easily, and so everything is dishwasher safe if you want to put it in there. We usually have so much dishes at our house, the pots don't go in the dishwasher. So I always kind of puzzles me when people ask, are they dishwasher safe? I'm like, I really don't know, because <laughs> I would never put mine in the dishwasher. They're just so easy to clean up, um, and the lid particularly hardly needs to be washed, just pretty much just rinsed off real well. So um, we're going to add a little oil here. Turn my heat up to medium to saute my onions and my vegetables. Well, first I'm going to braise my um, short ribs. I am going to um, use a casserole dish to just set them in as I, because I'll have to braise them in batches. Now, short ribs typically short ribs and these are beef ribs we don't i don't do pork and but I, we love beef ribs anyway but typically beef ribs have a little bone in them and um i think the bone adds more flavor but um i actually got the guy at the meat counter to cut me some boneless short ribs so where they've taken that same cut of meat and just cut around the ribs for you lot uh, just mostly for serving y'all's sake um, because it would be very difficult to have to pull that bone out and then give you know work out 60 or 70 portions so he actually really cut me some nice um, pieces and it's it's actually kind of nice to have these meaty pieces usually the bone pieces sometimes you'll get one that hardly has any meat on it at all so um, you will get a little extra flavor if you have the um, the bone in but um, these are just lovely um, like this. So just, um, I, I didn't even know such a thing existed until I saw them already wrapped at Publix and they had just one package. So then I asked, I said, can I actually have eight pounds <laughs> of these short ribs? Because I did one batch yesterday and one batch today. And so he, he made them up for me. So if you don't see them and you want them boneless, because it is a little easier to not have to deal with pulling out that little bone, but it's not, you know, if you're cooking for not so many, it's not that bad. So we want to let our um, pan get hot here, and then we're going to sear just so they're brown. Pressure cookers don't typically brown um, food when you're cooking it, so we're just searing it. Kind of locks that flavor in. Now that one probably could have been cut a little smaller. So we'll have to work in batches here. And you just want to brown them on all sides. That kind of locks in the, the juices and the flavors. While that's going, I thought I'd go back and um, we'll look at some trivia. How about that? The average person will consume 10,000 chocolate bars in their lifetime. <laughs> that's an average. When I told that to my son, who that same one that counts meals, he is, yeah, yeah. When we, um, when we adopted him, he told us that he had like, he went to the dentist one time and he had 15 cavities. He used to put um, sugar when he lived in Latvia. He loves Dr. Pepper. He would put packets of sugar in Dr. Pepper and drink it, yeah. So when I said that the other night, and he goes, well, some people would probably eat more than that. And I'm like, yes, you probably would. Um, but it was so, and I'll tell you, when we went to adopt him, it was Mother's Day while we were there. And of course, we had only had him a week, you know, and we had to live with him and him with us. And so he was talking, and he knew that we kind of taught people about eating healthy. So we were fixing to head out to the grocery store, and he goes, okay, so tell me do you not eat candy at all? And I was like, well, a little chocolate every now and then. He goes, 
But I mean, he said, so you would eat chocolate candy if you had it? And I'm like, not very often, but every now and then. And so he was kind of like feeling me out. And so we walk across the street to the little grocery store there. And I'm thinking, so he goes, I'll be right back. And I'm like, okay. Now, mind you, I only had him a week. And, you know, and so I'm not even here. This was in Latvia. So I look, I kind of spied on him to see what he was doing. And he's over in the candy section. And I'm like, that little rat, he is over there. He's going to sneak some candy, you know, and go take it in his room and eat it, you know. And I was just like, wow, he was drilling me to, you know, see if I approved. And so he's sneaking this. And he went on outside and was waiting for us outside the store when Brad and I um, got our groceries. We went out. I'm going to cry a little bit here because when I walked out the door, he had this little gift bag and a card and chocolate and gave it to me and said, Happy Mother's Day. And I was like, Sue, you terrible thing, thinking so bad about him. He was feeling me out to see if I would eat chocolate if he bought it for him. And I mean, he didn't just get a chocolate and hand me the bag. He got a gift bag, a card, and happy Mother's Day. So that was, um, yeah, I, I wrote that home to my girls and they're like, okay, we're crying. So I'm like, you're not gonna believe what he did. He's very thoughtful like that. <laughs> I didn't hear what you said. What did he say? Yeah, not bad for a week old child, yeah. How old um, Righteous was um, about to turn 16. Ryman's was 13 when we adopted him, yeah. Righteous, we got under the wire. If they're not adopted by the time they're 16, uh, they cannot be adopted out of the country, which means no one's going to adopt him. We, got, we, we came home a week and a half before his 16th birthday. And as long as the process has started, the adoption was not actually final until October, but as long as the process has started, it's okay. So... Yeah, so he would probably be terribly embarrassed if he knew I told y'all that story. But now it's going out to video land. He'll probably find it on YouTube or something. He's so computer geeky. He, no, I he mean, wouldn't oh be embarrassed. He'd be like, how many teenage daughters were represented in this class? There you go. He probably would like to. that. That's what he would, yeah. We yeah. go anywhere. We go to homeschool fairs or whatever. He is the one who makes 10 new female friends before we can leave. So hide and your daughters if you're... Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, and of course, you know, both boys, they have an accent. And I mean, what girl doesn't like a boy with an accent who can speak multiple languages, you know? And uh, we did one homeschool fair in Richmond, Virginia. And this was, I guess you guys had just come home. Yeah, we did. We they, need... had, they had just come home with Yeah, them. we left so the next week. Like... What an induction to our family. You go do the hardest homeschool show we do, four days long. Yeah, so and he's like, oh. this is my first. this is my first experience with him at all. My younger siblings had met him when they had gone to Latvia adopt. to adopt the younger brother, Ryman's, the first time around. And that's actually how they met Rytus. They were over there adopting Ryman's, and they met Rytus while they were there, and then started the whole process several months later but um so the girls already knew her but this was my first introduction to him and certainly Ryman's we had known for a couple of years at this point but this was the first time we had gone and done a homeschool fair with them curriculum fair and so all of these girls wow. like were flocking the booth and my mama hen older sister thing came out and <laughs> Yeah, I think there was a couple girls that were totally afraid of me by the time that weekend was over, which means that I did my job well. Because I did, I told them, I said, uh, they have a job to do, you need to run along now. So, yeah, it was really fun. That is the best part about being the oldest, can I just tell you? There are many benefits to being the oldest child. You get the most brain cells, you know, all of that good stuff. Um, but yeah, being that older sibling and being like, uh, no, you are not good enough for my brother. No, you are not good enough for my sister. Just run along. They all hate it, you know. They're like, go away. We're never going to find anyone with you around. It's like, that's the whole point. Hello? All right. So now we've got our ribs braised. 
We're not cooking them here. We're just braising them so they're nice and brown. All those good juices are locked in. And now we're going to add just a little more oil to this pan. And I'm going to brown my onions, saute my onions and carrots and celery. And I don't know if you can see, but there's some meat scraps kind of um, stuck to the bottom there. This is where you want a nice, heavy, heavy spatula. A little heavier, although I love my switches. You'll see me use it for everything, even cold, hot, or whatever. They're heat. Um, oh, oh, I thought you were fixing to dump that in. I was like, not yet. Um, okay, never are mind. These, are, this isn't measured for you. No, okay. No, I know. I realized I didn't have any measured, so I just grabbed it. That was for my topping for something. So, yeah. So, um, so I find that, um, and Lars, the German chef, actually taught me this, that you really do when you're wanting to scrape something up off the bottom, you really do want a little bit stiffer um, cooking utensil than this that's soft. So I love the Fissler Comfort Turner. It fits very nicely in your hand. Um, so that one, or these are our new ones. These are Dreamform. They're made in Australia. I've fallen in love with this spatula. It's great for scooping. I mean, you can serve with it. Um, it is stiff enough here. It's hard enough here that it can scrape those um, meat bits off the bottom. So we just got that used like that and then when you take it off notice the design of it it sits on your counter it doesn't rest on your counter so you don't get the blob of food there all of their products very very creative in their design and um just just like i said i've i've started loving it when i to cook with because i then i can just serve with it this one does okay for some things but it's just not quite deep enough to serve um this one i'm loving so got my onions. Was I supposed to put this in here? Yeah. And my celery and my carrots. Ashley, do you know what I need? I didn't get chicken broth. And I need some cloves of garlic out of the refrigerator. Um, just one container will be enough because I'm just doing one batch. So you just want to cook this for a few minutes until it, they're tender. They're going to get tender in the pressure cooker, um, so you don't have to be as uh, diligent to let them get softened um, at this point as you would cooking them in the stove. You would need to. Then I'm going to mince my garlic in here. I love my roast leaf garlic press. That's good. Just the way it's designed, it very easily minces the garlic. You really do want to use whole garlic, preferably even still in the skin. Lars, the chef, didn't even like mine peeled. <laughs> He's for sure not going to like the mince stuff because it it does ferment very quickly and so that will just give it a little bit of an off flavor there's nothing like fresh squeezed garlic and i know it calls for three cloves but can you really get too much nah. Nah. who measures garlic anyway my goodness let's just go ahead and put that in there And it's interesting that this, um, this recipe actually has a cup of, uh, a half a cup of coffee, and then we're gonna put the chocolate in at the end. But the coffee was actually comes from the days of um, wagon train days. And um, that's why one of the recipes in uh, one of our pressure cooker books is called Chuck Wagon Stew. And they use a cup of coffee in this beef, with the beef broth. And this is actually an old trick that my mother-in-law taught me years ago. Um, Sunday dinner at Brad's house was pot roast with brown rice and all the trimmings and salad. And I could never figure out why her roast tasted so much better than mine. I mean, it's just carrot stuff like that. She goes, oh, I learned a trick long time ago. Pour a cup of coffee over it. And it just makes it so rich. It doesn't taste like coffee. So you may be sitting there going, I don't want, it doesn't, it, believe me, it doesn't taste like coffee. Um, it just adds a, a real richness to the broth. And it, it, like I said, it's held over from 
wagon train days when supplies weren't easy to come by, you didn't waste anything. If there was coffee left in the pot, you know, from morning, you poured it in the stew. And so that's where that, um, that term chuck wagon stew came from, of using the coffee in that. So, all right, so I've got my um, vegetables browned or sauteed here until they're tender. And we're going to add a half a cup of wine. The alcohol will cook out, so don't worry so much about that. Also, a trick for if you ever burn something on the bottom of your stainless steel pot, a trick for cleaning it is to pour a little bit of wine in there and heat it, and it'll just clean the bottom right up. So um, we'll add that to our vegetables here. Oh, I think I was supposed to, yeah. And that's, I'm scraping all those bits off the bottom so it doesn't burn. Because if you leave those bits on, it will it'll can kind of burn down there and that'll give it a not so nice flavor. So now I'm gonna add my seasonings. I've got my thyme here. I've got my bay leaves. I've got my fresh rosemary that we chopped. Abby chopped it. And then I'm going to do my three cups of broth. I need to give y'all some chocolate. Y'all are very quiet. Perk up. All right, so how are the waffles? You like those? And that's sorghum. So sorghum's an ancient grain. So see, you wanna do, use some versatility with your grains. There's so many good grains out there. A little bit, we're gonna make buckwheat crepes. Where's my crepe batter? Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm like, please tell me y'all didn't think that was an extra thing, a waffle batter. That would not have worked. Okay. Okay, there we go. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay, so now we've got everything in here. We're going to return our ribs back to the pot. Just pushing them down in the broth here. And I found that 45 minutes was perfect they were fall off the bone they may would be ready in 40 but i just went on and did them 45. beef unlike chicken beef almost gets more or well, beef gets more tender the longer you cook it chicken will get tougher and tougher and tougher so you never want to overcook chicken but beef just will get more tender and um now not grilling but cooking like this with broth and stuff over it so there's not as big a chance of overcooking your beef as there is your chicken. So I would rather err on the side of cooking it a little longer than um, undercooking it because then I'd have to heat it all back up again, which is not too bad in the pressure cooker. If it weren't tender, then I could just bring it back up to pressure and heat it, you know, pressure it probably five or 10 more minutes. But I'm gonna just go ahead and do it 45 minutes. And then I love to let my, um, my when i'm cooking soups and stews and things like this i love to just let it naturally release so i'm going to put my lid on lock it into place i'm going to bring it up to pressure um, on high heat and then um, as soon as it comes up to pressure then i'll adjust my heat to medium just to maintain that pressure and then we'll start the time but because it's going to go for 45 minutes i'm going to whisk it back here to the back burner and um, so then we can move on with the paninis So I've got it all the way up on high heat and um, I'll bring it up when it comes up to pressure. How many of you have never seen me cook with the pressure cookers, the Fissler pressure cookers? They're made with um, German steel. They're just, are just a quality, quality um, cookware. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna, yeah, I'll slice one bit um, here for them and then I'll whisk that away. Actually, is that the one that just came out of the oven? Okay, I'm gonna use this one first because that's not spelt. Um, yeah, we're gonna use that one last though, Abby, okay? The, the bag back there is spelt, the one behind you. Cause that's red wheat and white wheat cause I didn't have spelt at home and I kind of was afraid that I used all my spelt this week. I'm falling in love with spelt, just so you know. 
Um, I think it has a little milder flavor than red wheat. It's got the flavor of red, but it doesn't have that bite. Um, and it's not that I have a problem with wheat or think wheat is bad. I don't. Um, but I just, I've just started using spelt a little bit, and I like it. I really, really like it. And the interesting thing about spelt is even though spelt technically has gluten, um, and so you don't have to do anything different to spelt bread than you would wheat bread other than add more flour. In my basic recipe that calls for four and a half cups of wheat flour, I need five and a half cups of spelt flour. I don't change anything else about the recipe. I don't have to add any of the gums and the starches like you do with other gluten-free grains. So spelt technically has gluten because you can make spelt bread out of it, but the, the, the problem that celiacs have with digestion is they cannot digest an amino acid component of regular wheat gluten. It's gliadin. They cannot digest gliadin. Spelt, though it has gluten, does not have gliadin. So, um, you know, I would never just out and out tell a, a celiac that they could eat this spelt, but I do have our spelt supplier. I spent a long time on the phone with him one day going over the differences in spelt and some other grains, and he said he has celiac friends that eat spelt with no problems at all, true celiacs. So um, anyway, so that's something, I, panini maker, yep. So um, that's just something to keep in mind, um, which beware, be warned, I'm working on um, an interview and a paper to address this whole gluten-free craze that's going on out there. It's just, it really, really, really is way out of hand. About 1% of the American population are true celiacs, 1%. About 10% have true wheat sensitivities. Um, everybody else should be able to eat the modern wheat that is not GMO'd, it's not hybridized. Wheat has not been approved to be ge genetically modified in this country. I'm sure it's coming. Big cartels will make sure that it's coming, but it's not. So no wheat in this country has been genetically modified. Are you hearing me? Okay, contrary to what you may read on the website and promoted by certain people, it's not happening. To be safe. Always buy organic. Organic, by definition, whether it's fruit, grain, whatever, cannot be genetically modified. So buy organic if you're concerned about that. But um, there's just a lot of misinformation about there concerning the modern wheat. And then I always have people say, but what if I feel better when I eat spelt? As a I'm like, well, then eat spelt. <laughs> um, you may be one of the 10% that does truly have a wheat sensitivity. If you truly have a wheat sensitivity, not a celiac, which only 1% of the population is true celiac, then you don't need to necessarily go gluten-free. You may just need to eat spelt, kamut, amaranth, quinoa, einkorn, emmer, some of the more ancient grains that don't have as much gluten and starch. It's really the starch, not so much even the gluten. Um, I talked to our kamut grower. He actually owns the rights to kamut in this country. I talked to him at length um, when I was on my trip last because I'm, I'm really getting ready to address um, the wheat belly book issue. That's, that's the big culprit. Um, anyway, so I was talking to this, the, he owns the rights to commute in this country, and um, that's what he was saying. It's, it's more the starch that seems to be the issue, not the gluten. There's a bakery in California that makes 100% commute bread. They put gluten in it. They add gluten in it to make the bread fluffier because Kamut and Spelt make heavier bread. Wheat is the king of bread making because it does have the highest gluten protein content. So it makes fluffy bread. That's why it dominates because people like the bread better. It doesn't mean it's bad. So anyway, they add gluten to this bread and um, all gluten in this country comes from wheat. <laughs> so the man asked the bakery, he said, aren't you kind of defeating the purpose of making Kamut bread? And he said, we've not had one customer complain that they have problems with eating the Kamut. He said, so he said, I'm thinking there's another dynamic besides gluten. Um, the amylopectin A is a starch. It's prevalent in beans. Uh, 
excuse me, do y'all know about beans? How many of y'all have um, unfriendly, uh, antisocial <laughs> reactions when you eat beans? It's that same amylopectin A. It's a starch. And yes, it is a little higher in the modern wheats than it used to be in your spelt and your einkorn and kamut and those grains. So yes, maybe you do have a little trouble, but it's not, it doesn't mean wheat is the most unhealthy food in the world, like some people might say. I actually heard someone say that. And um, doesn't mean it's a bad guy. It's not a franken wheat. It's not. It's been crossbred, not even hybridized nor genetically modified, but it's crossbred, which is a natural process to acquire certain traits of certain seeds. So anyway, I went on my little bent there for a minute, but yes. Right. Right. Well, there's, right, right. Well, that Denise's point is, uh, that she's making, is that part of the problem with, with allergies is several things. We're so nutritionally deficient, we're finding that we're allergic to things. But then also the fact that, I mean, why is corn such an allergen? It has no gluten at all. So it's a gluten-free grain. Why? Because corn syrup, corn sugar, corn syrup solids, they're everywhere. We're consuming massive amounts of them, isolated out, separate components. God never intended us to eat food like that. So um, and when we eat it whole and intact, it has all the nutrients there to help us break it down, just like milk, just like wheat. And that's what Denise is making a very good point. Your gluten is in things like um, soy sauce has gluten in it. Your... Um, uh, taco seasoning, you know, th these seasonings and things like that. And then, of course, white bread. Yeah, now I would say that's probably the most unhealthy food out there. And it's gluten and starch, pretty much. The processed grains and, uh, I mean, processed white bread or flour products that you buy in the store are gluten and starch, pretty much. Which, let me clarify this. There is no such thing as healthy whole grain in the grocery store of a processed food. There's no cracker, there's no um, bread, there's no muffin, there's no bagel. I don't care how much whole grain the label says it has on or it. Or how, how many grams of fiber yeah. there are in it. it. it there's no such thing. Um, and we don't have time to get into that. I'm going to, I'll watch for my paper and my interview. I'm going to do a YouTube interview. I'm, and there I'm are to. already a couple of really good articles that mom has already written on our website. You can go to our articles page and read some of them. Um, one that's really good that kind of debunks the whole grains must be sprouted fad that went through a few years ago um, is whole grain goodness is the name of that article it's excellent um, another a newer one that she wrote is called kernel of truth um, those are both really really good articles um, and then she does talk about there's one that's um, you know aller allergy free and she has written a couple of articles that cover some of those grains that if you truly do have an issue, there are whole grains, of course, that, that you can have. So, and it, 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 this is a hard subject because we probably get, oh gosh, at 10 phone calls a day and email after email after email from customers going, we're reading this and we watched this TV show and this person says that we, none of us should be eating this. And, you know, as scientific, yeah, at, at least. least. I mean, it's all the time, all day long. And my, it. and I get this from mom. Yeah, that's my the very passionate, make preachy side kind of comes out. And I get that from mom. And, you know, what I keep going back to, and, and you not, may not be here, but this is us personally, that as, as a child of God, I have to go back to what his word says. And Jesus compared himself to a kernel of wheat, and he said that he was the bread of life. And so I have to go back as, as one of God's children and go, I can't, I cannot buy into this. Now, do I think that our country and our government and the food industry does things to what God said was food? Yes, absolutely they have. But to, but to go here and say that nobody should be eating this bread and nobody should be eating wheat, that's a very broad blanket statement that doesn't apply to everybody. Right. And like I said, it's only about 10% that truly have um, wheat sensitivities.
Um, one thing you'll notice about the spelt bread, um, it's a little crumblier the second day, but um, it's very nice when it comes out of the oven. So it's a little more crumbly. And that's kind of one of the things that makes wheat so much nicer. It tends to stay moister longer, but your spelt and your kamut, both will get a little crumblier. So you'll have a little more trouble um, grilling these than you will your, ah, yeah, yeah. I just touched the edge of that. Guess what? It's hot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've got one. If you'll just sit it right there. Okay. So let's now go to our paninis. And I, um, if you, if you read there, <laughs> I actually saw this recipe in a magazine. And I thought, okay, this is very strange. Very, very strange. Why would you put chocolate on a grilled cheese sandwich? But with the orange dressing and I made it here, everyone loved it. And they were like, okay, this is different. Very interesting. And for lunch, I'm not sure. Somebody even asked me, they said, okay, is this dessert? Is this meal? I would do luncheon maybe with a nice salad on the side. Um, if you want to change up the flavor, maybe an orange dressing with some, you know, a chicken, some roasted chicken with on your greens. I think that would be a nice compliment. And you don't need very much. This is very, very rich. The recipe called for Fontina or cream Havarti cheese, which is a very, very, very creamy cheese. I think any one of our cheeses would do well, and I was going to use them in the class until the class kept growing and growing and growing, and I thought to slice um, any one, of, you know, that much slices, I just went, you know what, I'm just going with the already sliced, but um, this is the cream Havarti, which is a very, very creamy cheese, but our whole milk raw cheeses are very, very creamy, and I think would do very well making one or two of these sandwiches at a time, so um, I did discover that um, uh, it calls for three ounces, I'm sorry, two ounces of the mini chocolate chips. Um, I've, it's, uh, two ounces is about a quarter of a cup. I measured that out yesterday. And then I also found that if you cut that in half, three tablespoons is about one ounce. So three tablespoons of chips on each sandwich is about what you're going to use. So if you're making multiple, then you don't have to be weighing out all that. So it's about three tablespoons per sandwich. So all I do is I just sprinkle my chocolate chips on. So weird to do a cooking class where I don't use the ovens at all. <laughs> okay, my pressure cooker is up. I'm going to take just a minute here to show you the pressure cooker. Okay, so there's my pressure. See how the button here on top has come up to the, you see the little white rings? Those of you that have never been, this is the um, pressure uh, indicator. So it's on my white, second white ring, so that means it's high pressure. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to lower my heat to about medium just to maintain that pressure, and I'll start my time. Okay, all right, so back to our sandwiches. My, pre my dinner is cooking back there. And so what I do now for my, since I'm using chocolate chips, it said you could use shaved chocolate, but I'm just using my chocolate chips. I kind of use them for just about everything. I didn't, I used this the little minis. So if you were gonna, I wouldn't use big chocolate chips. I would get the little minis here. Um, of course, if you want to do a bar, like if you wanted to do this, I would grate it, okay? And then the box grater is fabulous that we sell. I've just never seen a box grater that grates like that. No, I'm not. I'm going to show them. I kind of press the little chips down in so that they don't just go everywhere. And then I use two pieces of cheese per sandwich, two slices. And I kind of fold it to fit, and I do that that fold on the top side and that fold on the bottom side. Does that? I'm just weird like that. You don't have to do that, but it just kind of makes things even a little bit. Man, this is 
burn day. I just burned my arm. All right. And then again, I kind of press the cheese into it so it kind of holds those little chocolate chips into place. And um, the panini maker that I'm using is by Breville. Um, we don't sell them here. I actually bought these as Christmas presents, and we love it. We do grilled cheese on a griddle all the time, but I got these for all my kids for Christmas, and I kept one for myself. So one of them didn't get one. I don't remember um, which one. <laughs> Lydia didn't because she got a grain mill for Christmas and that's what she wanted. I was like, okay, you're not getting the panini maker. So, um, yeah, we've had panini so much since we got this. It just does a great job of grilling and pressing. And now my boys have discovered using it. I came home the other day and they went, we didn't know how easy that was. I mean, there's no flipping. You just put the lid down and it, and it does it. And so, yeah, I come home to the smell of paninis all the time. They make all kinds of things, meat and cheese and just all kinds of goodies. Peanut butter and banana and chocolate chips. Ooh, I have not done that. Have you done that? I have done that. Wow. It's B-R-E-V-I-L-L-E. -L -L -E. It's a name brand. B-R-E-V-I-L-L-E. -L -L -E. Um, Sur la table. <laughs> Hang on, let me get these on. Okay. No, ma'am, I don't. I wanted to, but it just didn't happen before the class. Because, yeah, the first day I made these at work for our employees to taste, I sold two that day. Just because somebody stood here and watched me. It's not one of our employees. Yeah, well, I just burned. I mean, yeah. No, so I didn't. I, I Yeah, but one sandwich. They were like, okay, we like that. I just burned my arm on the pressure cooker back there. So anyway, um, the nice thing about this one is it'll adjust your height depending on how um, uh, thick your sandwich is. And I usually do a nice thick um, slice. And uh, also it will lock completely up so it doesn't touch at all. So if you want to do an open face sandwich, just slide it under there and melt the cheese. So it's very, very versatile. My son, you know, Caleb's not going to do anything just plain. He has um, caramelized onions on it, um, on the griddle. So um, it's just very, very versatile and we love it. It just really does a nice crisp job here. And I'm going to um, whisk this, this away. And like I said, the spelt bread is a little crumbly the second day, but it grills nicely. Our very favorite is um, the crunchy seed bread that our bakery sells. Or you, and you can add the seeds in because they get very crisp. Um, and cr even crunchier when you um, when you cook them. I was looking for my hearth pan. I have one. Um, actually, this is also I gave all the kids a panini press and a hearth pan that we sell. Falling in love with this. This is perfect for paninis because it has a nice wide um, shape and kind of rounded and um, just really really does a nice job and all the kids have fallen in love with it and Ashley promoted it in her class on Saturday and we sold out so this is the only one I have in the store but um, they're ordered and they'll be here probably um, next week sometime but I do have this one whoever's the first person to grab it is fine that's what I need and while she puts clay which if you don't know about our um, Redmond clay it yeah, is wonderful wonderful for burns so while she does that, we're going to talk really quick about um, some upcoming classes that we have it's coming okay. up. If it's you okay. haven't already signed up for them, we've got our, the next one that's coming up is the gluten-free 101 class. So if you do have someone who is truly a celiac, um, if you're going to cook gluten-free, you might as well be grinding those gluten-free grains fresh because there is no point in buying those, those grain flours from the grocery store because just like your wheat, once that grain is cracked open, it begins to oxidize and lose nutrients. So you might as well be grinding them fresh if you're gonna have to do it. Um, so we've got a gluten-free 101 class coming up on Friday the 15th. Uh, Sharon Fescannon and Denise Rogers are both going to be teaching that class. Then we have, you'll have to check the date because I can't remember. Uh, Mom and I have a bagel class coming up. I believe it's the week after that. Does anybody know the date? The 20th, February 20th. Um, and then I am doing a class on Tuesday the 26th with um, our good friend and author of the cookbook, The Shamrock and Peach, 
uh, Judith McLaughlin is coming back um, and she and I are doing a St. Patrick's Day class. And I am really, really excited about that class because I have had um, brisket brining Ugh. for four weeks now. So by the time that class rolls around, our, the brisket will have been brining for six weeks. And I'm Yum. really excited about that because that's Yum. how you traditionally make corned beef is from a brisket that has been brining for at least six weeks. So I'm really excited about that. We're also going to be doing some blue cheese souffles mm. and a, a, a mixed green salad with a turkey bacon <gasps> vinaigrette. I think you're doing that on my birthday. We are doing that on your birthday. So, um, and there's still everything. room in that class if you would, if you want to sign up for that. So I think, is that all we've got going on so far? We haven't scheduled March yet, have we? No. No. So gotta hopefully we'll be coming that, yeah, we got to do that Hopefully before today, we leave today. Before we leave. Yeah. <laughs> Getting our schedules together is crazy. Yeah. All right. Do um, you want to show them how you plate that? Um, in just a second, yes. Okay. One other nice feature is it has a lock, and so then you can pick it up by the handle and carry it off. There you go. Bye. Yeah. Have fun with that. But you can see, I, I like a little thicker slice, and you can see the nice size here. And when I made them over Christmas, I mean, when all of our kids are at the house, and their children and grand, and my grandchildren, their children, their spouses, it's about 23. So multiple times over the holidays, I had 23 to 28 people eating food um, and it was fun. So we did um, paninis one night and some potato soup and I would cut them, um, each one of these in like fourths in strips. Today I'm gonna cut eighths for y'all. But it was really a nice sized piece so, you know, eight or so people could eat and I just kept them coming off and you see how fast it was. So, um, and they actually have some, one of the few things I bought, I went out cause I knew I, I couldn't cook everything. So I went to the store and found all kinds of jars of like um, pesto and roasted tomatoes, I mean roasted peppers and some grilled onions. And you can do all that yourself, but I did find that and I love the pesto on the cheese side and, and then we did meat and cheese and I did a roast beef with horseradish and just, just anything and everything you can do. And um, so I'm gonna make the, the dressing here. <clears throat> The original recipe that I got this whole idea from, Ashley, here's the butter if you want this for basting. Um, the original recipe that I got this from um, called for an apricot dressing and using apricot preserves. And I did that and I tried that and I liked it. And that was the first day I made it. And we all thought it was very interesting flavor combination there and everybody liked it. But the more I thought about it, I was just like, I really like orange and I um, really like orange and chocolate. So yesterday I came in and made um, orange preserve, I used orange marmalade instead of the apricot. Hands down, we all liked it better. So you could use anything here. I mean, you could do strawberry, you could do raspberry, you could do anything, but I think you're gonna really like the tanginess of the orange because it's got the whole um, peel in there and it just, I really, really like that flavor. When Lars was here, I was so impressed with, you know, you think, oh gosh, you know, I, I felt so nervous being next to him and, and uh, you know, like, where do you, I was like, where do you come up with all these recipes? And he was like, I go on the internet, I read books and magazines and get ideas and then change it up. And then I was like, wow, I don't feel bad at all because that's what I do. I've told you all about mine, cook, my cooking magazine addiction. Yeah, yeah, I walk in the store. I mean, really, I, I buy one, a magazine, every time I go in the store. And um, so one day I thought, I could not buy any more magazines because I may only use one recipe in that whole magazine. And um, the whole time I'm in the store, I'm like, I am not going to buy a magazine. I am not going to buy a magazine. I am not going to buy a magazine. I got to the checkout, and I bought not one, not two, but three magazines. The first time I'd ever bought three at one time. Of course, one of them was the chocolate magazine, so um, which we've gotten some great ideas from here, which gave me the idea to have an everything chocolate class. So you can thank that addiction. But I haven't bought one since, so maybe buying three at a time is the answer. <laughs> so all I'm going to do is just um, on low heat, I'm softening my... Um, Sometimes these 
settings get me crazy. I'm just softening my preserves just slightly. It's got a timer thing here and sometimes I get going where I set it instead of, and then it turns itself off. So, so I'm just, oh man, smell that orange. It smells so good. And I did buy an organic um, orange marmalade. This one did, wasn't an all fruit one. The apricot, I did use the all fruit, but they didn't have an organic um, all fruit. So I just bought the little bit of, of cane juice there. Okay. Um, so this is one recipe and I find it makes a pretty good bit. I made a triple recipe yesterday, so it would make sure everybody had enough. Um, so all you're doing is just softening this so that you can stir in a little mayonnaise, a little mustard, it's just a teaspoon, Oops. I felt like with the apricot it wasn't a strong enough flavor that all I tasted was the vinegar. So I think the orange gives it that extra flavor. So if you're going to use apricot or strawberry or some other raspberry, um, I would cut back on the vinegar here. Just maybe even just a half. I know it's not very much and you're thinking, really? But this is not making a ton of, of sauce. If For two sandwiches, you're just doing a glaze here. Um, so there's that's my dressing for the sandwiches. Okay, my pressure cooker is cooking away back here, getting these ribs ready. All right. So now all we're gonna do for our sandwich, one on this plate. Actually, I'm not gonna plate these because then it'll mess up you cutting them. So um, I would just cut it in half on a diagonal and just either serve it as a dipping sauce on the table where you can just dip in it or just spread a little glaze on top, okay? So there's your um, sandwiches. You can take that to scrape it into the bowl there if you want. All righty, where are we? Sulfur is another nutrient found in chocolate, very prevalent in chocolate, and you may be going sulfur Sulfur is actually very, very important um, for your immune system, for fat metabolism, um, just, just really good. And chocolate is, a, is a, one of the richest food sources of it. So that's, that's another good thing to know. Now don't tell anybody that I said you could eat, that you needed to eat you know, all the candy bar junk out there, okay? You need to eat the real thing. So before you go buy a case of your favorite <laughs> Reese's or Snickers or whatever, uh, Hawaii is the only state in the United States where chocolate trees are grown. That makes sense. It's, it is a tropical um, tree. So, my son that uh, likes candy and likes sugar, he asked when I was telling him about all this stuff, he goes, can we grow those here? <laughs> it's like, no, I don't think so. So, anyway, all right, where are we at here? So we've done the paninis, or they're doing the rest, and now we are going to do, I'm going to make, y'all tired? You want an energy shake? Let's, okay, let's make the energy shake. And then we'll do the crepes, because they've got their hands full with the paninis. And um, we'll do the crepes next, after I do the energy shake for you. What was that? <laughs> yeah, I'm still missing my little tab here. It's in there. It's in here somewhere. Okay, so this is the Anka Shroom Original, the largest non-commercial mixer sold. We have a variety of colors now. If you're in the market for a mixer, save your pennies. Because if you buy this mixer, chances are you will never buy another mixer. Um, it has a five-year warranty, but mine is now 20 years old and going strong. And um, in the 20 years that we've, or more years that we've been selling these mixers, we've probably only seen 10 that needed repaired. And we sell a lot of these mixers. Um, it will last you a lifetime. It's built to last a lifetime with very, very little service that you ever, ever need done to it. Um, we're just very, very excited to have these and offer these 
It's really the only mixer on the market that's built to last. The rest are not going to hold up for what you're going to be using them for. Yes? Um, in comparison with the Bosch, her question is, in comparison with the Bosch, the design of the Bosch is built to last okay, except in the last couple of years, they've been having some some issues with them. I don't know if they've um, lessened the quality of them. We've had a couple of customers come in that bought a Bosch and a year later it's already making a grinding noise and stuff like that. And we've, we've heard this from other sources, so I don't know what's going on. I'm not a big fan of the design of the Bosch, the way it's designed with the shaft and all of that mechanism that you have to clean, but definitely the Bosch is the next best um, on the market. But it's a in my opinion, it's a very huge step down. Um, it, this is just, just save your money <laughs> and go ahead and invest in the best. And like I said, you'll never repair this. You'll never, I, I had a, a friend years ago who had multiple children like me and they started making bread as a little home business. They wore the Bosches out all the time. And as soon as she bought this, she never had any more trouble. So um, it's just built to last. Yes, Brad? You're going to have to come up here if you're going to say very much. It's all in the transmission is what he's saying. It's just, this is as beautiful machine inside as it is outside. And um, it's still made by the same company that's been making it since 1969. And it's still basically the same design that was designed in 1939. The optional attachments, as you can see, I'm using all sorts of things. I'm not just doing that to show you. I do this at home. I have all these attachments. I make so many things. It makes life so easy. Go ahead. I just wanted to say the thing that makes this different from any other machine in the world is the transmission. This transmission is a worm gear. That might not mean anything to you, but a lot of fellows will go, oh. I mean, this, it is the most efficient. You can't run off. Oh, right. It, <laughs> It is the most efficient transfer of energy from one direction to another. Wow, so that... they used to have a 450 watt motor to drive this thing. You could not bog this machine down with a 450 watt motor. The Bosch uses an eight, uh, a 700 watt motor on it, but its, its transmission is not as efficient, so it takes a stronger motor to do the same amount of work. And this at 450 watts, could dance circles around any other machine on the planet. But because people think wattage means strength, they up their motor to 600 watts and, and now there's, there's absolutely nothing that can touch this. But I'm just, I want you to understand it's the transmission that makes this machine last your lifetime. Maggie, blender, do I have a blender? Did you put it away? Mm -mm. I don't see it. I was just corrected. What? I've just been told that the Bosch has, a, has an 800 watt motor on it. But still, this will do almost, almost twice the capacity. All righty. Y'all need more chocolate to take all that in, don't you? And, and the KitchenAid is it's three to four times. There you go. Thank you so much. And ice. I need ice. Uh huh. The here. Let me get you. You want to put some in this bowl, and actually, then when you get some here, if you want to go ahead and fill this up, at some point. Okay. All right. I'm gonna make um, a raw energy shake. This recipe is in your handout. I knew a lot of you were our old timers and had been coming for a while and that you had probably had the chocolate satin, the chocolate pudding that I made for lots of classes with the avocados. It had no milk at all and it was a completely raw. Um, so I, I did put that in your handout. If you've never tried that or tasted it, 
make it. Your children, don't let your children see you make it. They will never know it is avocados. You can serve this for breakfast. They will think you've lost a few marbles. If you serve them chocolate pudding and strawberries, bananas, and pineapple for breakfast. Absolutely delicious. Absolutely healthy. I mean, not a compromise in any way, shape, or form. Very, very delicious. We sell all the ingredients. It's really, really easy. You dump the avocados, the cacao powder, the coconut cream, the vanilla, and the agave nectar in a blender. Blend it until it turns shiny. It'll turn shiny just like nasty chocolate pudding from the store. And um, I've served it at so many luncheons or it's my go-to dish to take to potlucks. People absolutely have no idea that that's what it is. And just don't tell them. Uh, make sure no little stray speck of green uh, that you know may be on the edge. Just push that back down in there and blend it before anybody sees it. Absolutely amazing. Um, years ago, I think it was in 2007 or 2008, um, some friends came up and actually taught a raw foods class. And um, she kept telling me about this, this drink that she makes that she said it's, uh, she called it her iced coffee because she had given up coffee to go on the raw food thing for uh, like 21 days or something. She kept telling me about it and she said, Sue, I'm making it in the class and you really need to get the ingredients, you know, for people to to have it. And I had always prided myself over the years that, you know, I teach people to eat real food. Nothing weird, nothing strange, nothing that you can't pronounce or that you don't know what it is. And so she kept telling me about this cacao or cacao, maca, lacuma, and I'm like, okay, no, 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 I don't want to. And finally she said, Sue, I'm using it in the class, get it, everybody's going to taste this and they're going to want to use it. And so I started, um, you know, looking at it and I was like, all right. So we ordered it, I'll never forget. Um, and I was recovering from my illness. This was in September after I had been sick and everything in May and had surgeries and all that. So I was still a little low energy and, you know, not feeling great. And so Brad calls me from work one afternoon. He goes, Sue, all this maca stuff came in. I mean, that's why he kind of, all this stuff came in that I don't, you know. So I was like, okay. I said, bring me, bring me one of each home. And so I called my friend. It was about 6 o'clock in the evening. And um, I said, Okay, I want to make sure I've got this recipe right before I make it. And she goes, okay, you're not going to make it now, are you? And I was like, yeah, why? And she goes, Sue, it's very, very energizing. And she said, I mean, very energizing. And I was like, ready for bed anyway at 6 o'clock. And I'm like, it won't matter. Won't matter. Won't hurt me. This will be fine. So I make the drink and I drink it. 3 o'clock uh, in the morning... I was up doing, and so the paper that you have there is my three o'clock writing and um, research <laughs> paper that I wrote, and I tried the chocolate satin for the first time that night. I'm like, woo, woo, I was just in the kitchen. And, um, and the thing is, it is naturally energizing. I wasn't like strung out on caffeine. I didn't have the jitters. I was just very awake, very energized just really, really loving life. And um, um, maca is a root, um, a Peruvian root. It's a whole food that's been dehydrated and powdered. So it's not like um, an extracted food, like so many of your protein powders that are extracted. They extract just the protein out of the whey or the eggs or whatever. Maca is a whole food and it's got all the amino acids. It's a complete protein. It's got lots of calcium, lots of B vitamins, lots of vitamins that, vitamins that nourish the endocrine system. Does not naturally contain hormones. So it, it's not one of those roots or plants that has natural estrogens or progesterones. What it does though, nourishes your endocrine system so that you can better produce these hormones that your body needs. I've had one lady tell me that um, she totally uh, quit having hot flashes when she started drinking this, um, this drink every day. So um, just very, very nourishing. I'm not a big fan of chocolate milk. And so I actually quit putting the cacao powder in there. And I just ground the, the nibs, a tablespoon of the nibs, and put them in there. So the drink tastes more like a um, caramel, because the maca has almost a caramel flavor. And then the nibs 
don't grind up enough to make it taste like chocolate. You just bite into them. So, because I still wanted to get the, the magnesium and the antioxidants from the chocolate, but I just didn't want to taste chocolate milk. But I'm going to make it for you like um, she made it, except she made totally raw. She used cashews and water and ice. And um, I have raw milk at home, so I just use milk um, typically to make mine. So I'm just going to make it with milk just because it's easier for me to do that way. Let's see, I'm sorry, I didn't get my maca out. Um, Lacoma is a Peruvian root, uh, uh, fruit, actually. I don't know if I have... Uh. And it's high in your B vitamins, um, particularly vitamin B3, which is your niacin, which is very good for your heart and emotional and energy and things like that. Um, in, it's mostly for flavor in Peru. Um, there's flavors of ice cream, chocolate, vanilla, and lacuma. And lacuma is, is more popular than your chocolate and vanilla. So that's kind of what you're using that for. Maca and cacao or cacao, however you want to say it, go hand in hand. A lot of, in Peru, a lot of, um, if it has maca, it typically has the cacao. And like I said, the main thing about the cacao, besides the antioxidants and it being a raw chocolate, a really good for you chocolate, um, it's, it is energizing. Not stimulating like caffeine, but very energizing. But I, when I left the cacao out, I thought maybe I'm not going to see as much energy. You will even from just the maca. So it just depends on how you like it. I will make it the way um, she kind of made it, except I'm going to use the milk. And um, except I haven't made this in a little while, so I'm going to. Um, I just use about a cup of milk and then the ice instead of the, uh, the nuts. Hey, Ashley, I don't have any Ho Shao Wu. Would you see if I have any in there? If not, would you go get me a bottle? Ho Shao Wu um, is also known as Fo Tea. It's a Chinese herb, and um, I just found that the cheapest, easiest way to keep it was um, I just buy it encapsulated. It actually is a very good nutrient to take. It has natural anti-inflammatories and natural um, quercetin, which is... Um, known to have, also known to have antihistamine properties. So it's just good to have on hand and encapsulated makes it very easy to um, take. So I will just take the capsules and just open two of them to, and dump in here. And all of these are, all of these recipe, this recipe, you could leave any one thing out if you wanted to. Um, you know, don't think, oh gosh, I gotta have all of that. But, you know, because it is a little bit of an investment, but I did find that it lasted me several months drinking a shake every single day. Um, so it, it is an investment, but it, it, it lasts a while because you're only using about a tablespoon. So I'm just opening my capsule of Fo Tea or Ho Shao Wu. And um, the Chinese word Ho Shao Wu means head full of black hair. And the emperor was known to take faux tea all the time, and he had black hair until he, like, he was 90-something years old. He didn't have gray hair at all. So I'm not sure. It hasn't helped mine yet. Um, still, um, Brad says I have artificial intelligence here <laughs> with my brown. But, um, okay, so, yes, ma'am? Okay, with me there's no quick, but go ahead. Yes. Um, I, there was a discrepancy. It is the same thing. One time we got the bottles in and they were labeled that way, so we changed it, but it's really, it's typically you'll see it as Ho Shao Wu. Yeah, sorry about that. I didn't catch that. Um, okay, so it's a teaspoon of Lakuma. And if the tablespoon of maca doesn't give you the results you're looking for, you can certainly um, add more. It's not going to hurt you to have a little bit more. Absolutely. Yep, I had a lady even ask, um, is it okay for teenagers as well? 
Um, I actually had a lady in there ask if, you know, her young children. Yes, absolutely. Remember, it doesn't have hormones in it, naturally. It's, and it's a whole food. It'd be like saying, can my baby have sweet potatoes? It's, it's a root um, vegetable that's just dried and powdered. And it's just very nourishing to the whole endocrine system. Yes. No, no, it's just, it's a food that's just very nourishing. Um, very much like I find grains to be very energizing. Yogurt is very energizing because of all the B vitamins in there. Um, so, you know what I'm saying? That's what I mean when it's not a stimulant. Even, even your cacao, it's, it's not like stimulating. It doesn't affect your central nervous system like caffeine does. It is stimulating, but not like caffeine. Does that make sense? I think it's time to pull this back out for my almost 10-year-old. Yeah, uh, yeah. A complete protein means that it has all eight of the essential. There's certain amino acids, um, which are the building blocks of pro protein, that are absolutely necessary by your body and that your body cannot make. You have to get it from food. There's eight of them. And when you say a, um, a food is a complete protein, it means it has all eight of those that your body can't make. Then there's some, when you supply those, your body can make some of the other amino acids from those proteins. But um, like grains are not a complete protein. Eggs are a complete protein. Milk is a complete protein. Soybeans are a complete protein. But it usually takes, your, your beans are not a complete protein. It usually takes um, a combination of grains and beans to make your complete protein. Uh, why you like milk with peanut butter sandwiches? Because peanut butter and milk m together make a complete, gives you all your amino acids you need. Okay, let's see. Did I put my agave in there? I can't remember what I've done. Did I? Okay, thank you. Um, now I need vanilla. I don't think I have a yukon syrup open, and that's mostly for flavor. It does have like a lot of fiber. Can you imagine a sweetener that actually has fiber? Um, the yukon syrup does, and I think we only have one bottle out there. So I'm just going to go with not using it today. And then I'm going to use a shot of nutmeg. All right. I probably should have doubled this, so I'm going to like make this one and make sure I like the taste of it and then And if you want it really, really icy, to me, if you get it really icy and make it like ice cream, it almost tastes like a frosty. Yeah. So But I'll make it more liquid. Well, I said I was going to make it liquid. Looks like I made it like ice cream. And then taste. Always taste to see if it's what you want it to be. You can always add more flavoring. Wow. That's pretty good. I think it could be a, just a tad more chocolate. Where's my cacao? and just a tad sweeter. I don't find it mixes with yogurt very well, the maca. It's just kind of interesting. I tried it once thinking I would put it in my yogurt shake. Yeah, it was a little, little, little strange. But it's great time of year coming up. You know, spring, summer, it's great time. This, was, this is my breakfast like in, in when it's warm out. Not a real fan of it in the winter when it's cold. So. Um, but it's a great um, afternoon pick-me-up, like 3 o'clock, not 6 o'clock. Okay. Did I put the vanilla? I did, didn't I? Okay. Ashley. Um, if you, when you make this, I'll give you the recipe. I did a cup of milk in the ice and I did three tablespoons of cacao and three tablespoons of agave. So there's that. I'll give that over here for her to start serving and she can make another one. All right, we got crepes and candy. Mm. But yeah, don't think 
for a minute that this is like stimulating. When I say it's energizing, it's because it's nourishing your body and giving your body the nutrients that you need. And it is noticeable, very noticeable. And, but it's not like, oh, I don't have my drink today. It's not like that. You'll just notice that on days that you have it, um, you'll, you'll be very energized. Um, maca a lot of, has the reputation of kind of being a woman's um, food. It, it, guys may like for you to take it, your husband's. Yeah. Um, I'm just, that's all I'm going to say there. Sometimes it helps you kind of be a little more exciting. And um, so I had a friend of mine that she went looking for it because she didn't live here. Oh, Brad's coming. No, 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 you stay back there. I see you getting up. I would have thought he was the Wizard of Oz the way he comes bounding out of those curtains. Man. Anyway, um, yeah, I'm not sure where I was going with that. Move on. Okay. Uh, anyway, my friend who went looking for it because she went, didn't live near me, um, she went in the health food store and uh, she was asking if they had it and they said, yeah, and she said, we sell a lot of it. The men really like it. And she went, really? What do they need it for? And, and she said, the athletes, it's very good for endurance and that's why athletes and bodybuilders will actually take maca for endurance and just because it's a complete protein too. All right. Um, I think we're moving on to. Do it. <laughs> no one asked that. She's like, she said, some of y'all are going to want to know. Uh, no, your husbands may want to know if we sell it by the bucket, but no, we don't sell those it by the bucket. We just the one pound bags. So, but I hope you enjoy it, and that'll give you a little pick me up. I think I'll go on and make the tea. And how much more time do my ribs have? Eight more minutes. We'll start the polenta when that is done. All right, we're ready for the crepes. Oh, I do need this mixer. I'm gonna make my um, mascarpone um, cream filling. The original recipe that I got this idea from called for ricotta. So you could totally use ricotta, but like I said, when I saw that and made that mascarpone uh, icing, I was like, I fell in love with it. I really, really fell in love with it. So I bought the ricotta and got here and was going to try it. And I went, you know what? No, I think I'm going to just use this cream. And I really, really liked it so much so that I went online to see if you can make it. And I did. And I can't remember how exactly I did it. No, I can't. But um, uh, I made it yesterday. I started it yesterday morning. And all you do, you need 18% um, fat, butter fat. So what the, on, online, you can find it if you just Google it, but um, I'm just going to give you, it's a pint of heavy whipping cream and a pint of half and half. And you put the half and half in the top of a double boiler and then you put the pint of whipping cream and just stir it. You heat it very gently. You don't want to, so you got to do a double boiler. That was the only hard part, which that's not hard. Double boiler and you bring the temperature up to 185 degrees. You add two tablespoons of lemon juice and you just hold it, at, adjust your heat to hold it, cover it and hold it at 185 for about five minutes. That's it. So pint of cream, pint of half and half, two tablespoons of lemon juice. Heat it to 185, add the lemon juice. You'll see it thicken right away. Let it cover it, let it cook for five minutes. Just kind of keep checking it so it doesn't keep going up because you don't want to burn the milk. Then you turn it off, put the whole mess in your refrigerator, let it chill. It says overnight, but I did it yesterday morning, put it in the refrigerator, and last night before I went home, then I strained it. I was afraid, I wasn't sure if it would go in my um, yogurt cheese maker without the cheesecloth because it's a little, it's not as hard a curd as yogurt is. So I just put the cheesecloth, which we sell, in my yogurt strainer and totally used it to drain my um, cheese, and you've got to see this. This is exactly, tastes exactly like what I buy in the store. I mean, we're talking, it was very, very easy to make. Look how beautiful that is. Uh-huh, I let it drain overnight. Either way, I mean, if you just let it drain eight, 10, 12 hours, something like that. 
So I've got to weigh it. I didn't want to mess with it until y'all saw it. Um, so let me weigh it and I can tell you if it's cheaper to buy it or because um, I can tell you how much one little eight ounce container costs. Oh wow, that's a pound and two ounces. So basically the cost of a pint of whipping cream and a pint of half and half, a pound and two ounces, and one eight ounce container, this costs $4.39. So that's much cheaper. And I mean, it's really easy. I'm not into making all this stuff that's very, very difficult. But having this, see my whey drained out just like yogurt did. So the only thing even remotely different was a double boiler and that's just not that difficult and just I mean it took me all of the five minutes to mix it and then I just put the pot and everything in the refrigerator let it chill down about eight seven eight hours and then just cut my cheese cheesecloth big enough that it lapped over so that it didn't um, fall down in the strainer and then I just let it drain just like you would yogurt and and that whole amount fit in this cheese um, strainer. So there's my cheese. Um, you're welcome to uh, taste it at the end of the class if you want. We tasted it side by side. Little more tart here, but they put citric acid in it in this one, whereas they don't in here. Um, if you don't have this in any of the recipes, you can totally use cream cheese. Cream cheese is a little more salty, um, has some gum sometimes in it. You just have to, you have to wash it. But this is an Italian cheese that they use a lot. Um, tiramisu is probably the most popular dessert that you maybe have experienced this cheese with. Um, I make uh, lemon poppy seed muffins. My kids, that's one of their favorite. It's my basic muffin recipe and I just add the juice of a lemon and zest of a lemon, a little lemon flavoring and then poppy seeds and I put them in my muffin cups and then my kids always love for me to put just a little cube of cream cheese down inside each one. Well, I decided to try this, but when you taste it, it doesn't have a lot of taste. It's very mild um, because it doesn't have the salt that the cream cheese is. So I did sweeten it a little and put a lemon, little lemon zest in there and then put a blob of that down in the muffin. Oh my goodness, when we cut the muffin open, it melted more than the cream cheese does, and so it just kind of looked like you had melted butter on the muffin. It was very, very delicious. And then I served the rest of the cheese on the side. Y'all are getting glazy. I drink your maca. You'll be okay in a minute. Um, I'm getting a little glazed over there. That maybe was a little more information than you needed to know in this class since I didn't um, write that in the book. But, um, okay. Oh. Um, you know, I just really don't know. I just made it yesterday, so um, I'll have to check that out and see. Yeah. I would think probably, in fact, the recipe may have said um, it might have been a couple of weeks in the refrigerator. Yep. Okay, so I'm going to make the, um, the cream filling for the crepes first. And that is, I'm going to need two of these cartons. need my double whisk bowl. You can see how much I use my whipping bowl. I use it a lot. And it comes standard with the machine. So you let your, um, let your cheese soften. And like I said, if you only have cream cheese, you can do that. The recipe originally called for ricotta. So any, any one of these would be fine. Just whatever your taste prefers. Um, so I'm going to just do my... Ah, go down in there. Oh, man. This is the filling that we're going to put inside the crepes, okay? The uh, chocolate crepes with the chocolate um, mascarpone uh, filling. And I'm actually probably, I wonder if this could make, you think this could hold a double? Or should I just do it twice? I think I'll just do it twice. You think I could? All right because we want plenty of filling, don't we? This one, this recipe I got real creative with. And like I said, again, I love chocolate and orange together. So we're gonna use a little orange zest here. Um, I did find a, ch a coffee flavored 
cheese in the store. Um, Publix, it, these are found in the deli section, you know, where the cheese is. Not at the counter, but you know where the more specialty cheeses are? It's there. You won't find it like over where the yogurt and stuff yeah. is. It's where the brie and, and that kind of stuff. That was one. Uh, one cup of milk was, is what I make for myself. And that's why I made it. And I was like, I meant to make a double, but I'm so used to making the single. And a single will totally fit in the Tribes blender. And it'll, it'll do really well in there. Maybe not with so much ice, but. And what I do, like I said, I, I'm not a big fan of, of chocolate milk. So I, um, I will just um, be kind of like you do your flaxseed before you make your smoothie. Just do a tablespoon of the cacao nibs and just blend them, then just turn it upside down and then add my milk and my other stuff. And it almost, the maca without the chocolate, the maca and the lacuma and all that, almost reminds me of um, a, jamo a jamocha milkshake. You know, it's kind of got that caramel kind of taste to it. It's really, really nice. So just get creative there. That recipe is just an idea, so you don't have to, don't have to necessarily do just that. All right. I was. Absolutely. You could certainly use that as a morning meal replacement. I usually find that when I do that, I'm very, very satisfied. And that's another thing. I mean, because the maca is a complete protein, why buy these isolated protein powders? Why not just, you know, and use that instead and these if you've got teenage boys that are into bodybuilding it's got all of your essential amino acids there and athletes are known to look for maca for the endurance and all that okay so let's um keep going here let's make we got a fourth of a cup of honey granules i actually am going to use the powdered honey granules here so it won't be as as grainy okay So I'm going to do a fourth of a cup of my honey granules. And it should be four teaspoons of cocoa powder. Ashley, can I have the um, cacao? Because I'm actually going to use, because this is raw, I'm going to use the, um, I need, that's what I need. I'm going to use the raw cacao powder. Oh, you need that? Yes, you do. Have you got the vanilla over there? Can I borrow it for a minute? Does that taste like it? Thank you. you Thank you, ma'am. Sorry, I'm covering up your recipe. That's all right. I just want to make sure I do this right. All right, so I'm doubling this, so I'm going to do two teaspoons of vanilla. And then I'm going to do some orange zest. It, it says, what, a half a teaspoon? Please, whatever. I don't think you can ever get too much. So, um, so we'll do this. And um, I remember when Lars, the German chef, was here, I keep referring to Lars. He's so fabulous. How many of y'all have seen Lars and you've seen the video? He's just so great. It's always good to have a chef on hand. You learn all kinds of tricks. But I had always zested how can I even, do, oh, I had always zested this way, like that, and so I noticed that he zested this way, and so I was like, why do you do it that way, and he said, Be so I can see where I've been, <laughs> and I always did it this way, and stop, and look, and then stop, and look, because you don't want to get too deep, and get that white, you know, into the white pithy part, so, um, you want to uh, be able to see where you've been and see how deep you've, you've gone there. So you just hold it in your hand and just shave it around. I love orange zest, lemon zest. Nothing perks up a recipe. If you're doing something that's orange or lemon flavored, 
go just add a little zest to it. It's just, it's exactly what it says. It's zest. So let me wash my hands here. All right, so I'm going to add a little zest. I also find that um, when you're adding this to your muffins and things like that, your whole grain, um, if you're, if you're um, getting your ideas from a white flour recipe, you're probably going to have to double most of your seasonings and flavorings and your spices in your whole grains. I just find that it, there's so much flavor there, even in white wheat and soft wheat. There's so much more flavor there as opposed to white sugar and white flour that I typically, if I'm working, you know, getting an idea from a white flour, white sugar recipe, I will double and triple. I mean, double my uh, spices, not double and triple. Okay, so I have everything in here. I'm now going to turn this down a little low so that cocoa powder doesn't go everywhere. Now I can speed it up. Just going to whip it until it's light and fluffy. And I'm going to stop it and I'm going to make sure all this good cream is stirred down. And then again, since I'm using the honey granules, I'm just going to let it sit here for a few minutes while I prepare my crepes and then I'll whip it again before um, I use it to fill my crepes. All right, so let's get our crepes making. Now, you can certainly make crepes in a little frying pan. Um, you'll just, uh, I don't know if I have the directions there for a frying pan, but I love the crepe maker. It is so easy, so nice to use, and you get just about perfect crepes every time. You're going to mess up probably the first one that you do, <laughs> but once you get the hang of it, um, it's just so, so easy. I see some of y'all needing water. Um, feel free to get up anytime. We have a dispenser back there, but also in the cooler, we have bottles of our ionized and um, alkalized water for a small donation to Real Bread Outreach. If you want to, you can help yourself to that. All right. Uh, traditionally, for many, many years, Crepes were made with buckwheat flour. So this is a great place to use an alternative flour besides wheat. So I made all the crepes today, and I think they make a little nicer batter. You can see you want the batter to be the consistency of heavy cream. See how that is? That's you, it's got a little bit of fight back power to it, and um, so you want it to be a little thick like that. You, so you just, the basic recipe here of the buckwheat crepes, um, you just go ahead and add your milk and everything and then add your water until it's the consistency that it needs to. Most of the time, and most, when I was doing research on crepes back a year or so ago, most of the time it tells you to make your crepe batter and let it sit, at least for several hours. So it's, I actually made this yesterday, and that's a very typical thing to do is to make it and let it sit overnight. I have made the batter and used it right away and not let it sit at all and it worked just fine but for some reason most of your crepe batters and recipes will tell you to let it sit overnight in the refrigerator of course because it's eggs and milk and then you want to set it out before you make it and let it come to room temperature. So the nice thing about um, my Kachina Pro crepe maker is again it has a light here that will go um, off, let me see, <laughs> no, it comes on when it's hot, um, heated, and it will go, no, goes off when it's heated and comes on when the crepe is ready. So, and it comes with this little pan and this little tool. And so all you're gonna do, this might be just, just a tad thick. Let me see about adding some water here to it. Um, I added the cacao. The, uh, um, up at the top there, I substituted for one quarter cup of the flour, I substituted a quarter cup of the um, cacao or cocoa powder, whichever one you want to use. So now all you do is you just pour it into your 
your pan here. And crepes cook very, very quickly. They're kind of a cross between a pancake and an omelet. <laughs> um, so they cook very, very thickly, uh, quickly. And um, the, the trick that I've kind of learned with the crepe maker is um, you want to you want to lift it up, turn it completely upside down, and you're going to dip it in the batter. And I've just slightly, and I'm talking ever so slightly, turn it to the side, and then you want to kind of roll it and swirl it. And you don't want to go too deep. You just want to lightly coat um, the crepe pan. Um, Ashley or Maggie, there's actually another crepe paint maker back there on the shelf. Um, if you want to get that, we can get them both going at the same time. You see how it's drying out and that's all you're looking for? It's, it really doesn't take just a very short time to cook these. They store beautifully in the refrigerator. Just slide them in a um, Ziploc bag. Let them come to room temperature before you try to serve them or pull them apart. If you're going to freeze them, I would put wax paper between them. But they store very, very well. So if you have crepes on hand in the refrigerator, uh, it's not hard at all to come up with a dessert. I mean, you can put whipped cream or just some strawberries or just some chocolate syrup or whatever. Um, I've made savory dishes with the crepes and I've made the sweet dishes. The little spatula that it comes with is real handy for just lifting the edge there. Once you get part of it up, you just lift it up. And there you go. So you just, you don't want to go too deep. You just want a light film on the top. And um, there you go. Does anybody want to come up and try one? Come on, Denise. You know you do. You know you do. You do want to let these cool before you, um, hey, darling, I didn't even <laughs> notice that was you. I should have with you well, sitting by your room. I was planning on being starving, so I thought, okay. Well, I yeah. Mean, I mean, you know. So she's going All right. to come up and eat. So yeah. All right. Well, I didn't mean to eat one. I mean, we we're going to give y'all one, but I meant you want to try making one. Oh, gosh, yeah. Okay. Well, we were gonna eat it. well you're going to eat it too, but. All right. So there we go. All right. So you just want to turn it completely upside down. All right, she's got to take her shoes off. That's a little scary. Not sure if we're getting our feet in here. Yeah. All right, t pick it up. Turn it completely upside down. There you go. And just, yep, just kind of, there you go. Little swirl, uh -huh. and then lift it up. Is it completely covered? Flip it over. Look at there. She did it. All right. How long do you let it sit? It, it'll, um, the light will actually come on when it's done, but you'll see it get dry. Once it's completely dry looking, it's ready and it's not very, very long. So, um, all right. I found the easiest way to um, put my cream fillings in the uh, inside the crepe is with a pastry bag. So um, I'm going to get my pastry bag ready and we'll load the, the filling up and we're going to, um, I want these to cool though. You want these to completely cool before you put a cream filling like this in. If you don't, it's going to melt it because it, it's very delicate how, how fast it melts. So um, I'm going to let the ladies, uh, I'll let Denise try this. All right. And then I'll let my wonderful helpers swirl it. Yep, just a little because you don't want to like dip it way down. Okay, now flip it. You should be covered. That's okay. Dip it back. I'll dip it back. There you go. We'll do another round. There we go. Like I said, you I can't really to overdo everything. So therefore, I underdid, and then you, look what I did. Yeah, that's right. okay. That's okay. You can eat that one. My daughter. <laughs> my daughter. <laughs> what? Your daughter outdid you? She she cooks better than I do. I mean, you know, that's so. all right. Yeah. That's okay. You can't mess up a crepe. Even if you mess one up, just drizzle something on it and pop it in your mouth and eat it. It's just fabulous. You really, and like I said, you're going to, like this one cracked a little, but that's okay. We can fix that. It's, it's still chocolate. It still works. So just put something on it and eat it. I do notice that these are not very tasty plain, whereas the plain crepes without the cocoa in there actually do taste, taste fairly nice, just plain. 
but the cocoa adds that bitterness. Um, if you added a little sweetener to it, to the batter, it probably would taste better. But once we get this filling in and then we're gonna put strawberries on it, drizzle it with chocolate syrup and add our almond whipped cream, we're gonna be fine, okay? So, um, yep, y'all are done, y'all are dismissed. So, all right, so we'll just, Anybody else want to try? All right. Well, let's get our cheese here in our piping bag. Oh, am I? Oh, we'll be fine. We'll be fine. You got to do polenta. Oh, we haven't served the ribs. All right. Is it five to one? Okay, we're okay. They're still get y'all are getting candy, so I've got candy made. Never fear. I was just taking my time. I thought we had all the time in the world. Cause I keep going. We haven't fed them much food in this class. Well, here, y'all take it and fill the, fill the piping bag. Oop. Yes, ma'am. Right? No, buckwheat, no. Um, the recipe here, you've got your um, regular flour. Traditionally, that's just what I was telling you. It was, it was buckwheat flour was used for a long, long time before they started using wheat but you can certainly use wheat. I find that the wheat is, um, flour is a little more delicate than the buckwheat, if you can imagine that. Um, and usually, I can't remember which one it is. One of them is typically for savory crepes, and one flour is when they're gonna do the sweet ones. I wanna say the soft wheat is usually for dessert crepes, and your buckwheat is usually for your savory crepes, because they make a little heartier, yes, a little heartier um, crepe, your um, your buckwheat crepes are. Um, Abby, if you can bring me that over here, I'll show them what I'm gonna do here as soon as you get it in the bag. I'm gonna show them how I'm gonna fix this. All right, let me do the almond whipped cream. Man, alive, how did it get so late? Y'all had your energy shake, so you're all right, right? I was just going so slow and telling y'all all kinds of stuff because I'm like, I haven't made very much in this class, but I guess I did. Sorry. And you are going to make the toffee. I am going to make the toffee, and that's pretty easy. Let me get this. Oh, I still got to make the polenta, so we've got to get it cooking. <laughs> all right. Are y'all okay with 30 minutes? I can be done in 30 minutes. Yes, they're in that bowl. You had them. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we need, um, where's my almond? Don't leave, don't leave. You really don't want to leave. You're like, I have to go. Where's my agave? You see, I'm losing everything. Okay. That's because y'all stole it. Okay. Thanks to Maggie. She does all my chopping and washes my dishes fast as I mess them up. Maggie is so, so precious. Okay. All right. Um, you know, I just don't know. I don't work here. No. <laughs> they don't let me. $37.99. Um, and I should have, uh, you probably can go online or maybe ask them at the, um, the front checkout for the handout from the crepe class that I did about a year ago. Um, um, email and ask for it. Okay. <laughs> Ashley's like, yeah. Um, email and ask for the crepe class handout because there was uh, the chicken asparagus crepes. Amazing. Um, I think I did that. Okay, so I'm going to got my gasket. Yes. Okay, so I need my. Uh, yeah. What am I looking for? That's it. Yep. All right. You can tell I'm losing it now. I thought I was doing so good. I'm really upset with myself. I kept eliminating stuff. Y'all are like, okay, what did she eliminate? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, like I said, you want to make sure this is such a delicate cream. You want to make sure that the, the crepe is cool. Oh, look at her. I didn't do all that pretty stuff. Okay, and then all you do is roll it. 
cover up her pretty stuff. You may not be able to put quite that much in. And then the almond whipped cream here. And then some strawberries here. And like I said, if you have these crepes already made, this can be a very, very pretty dessert that you can wow your friends with, and it really is just not that, that difficult. Um, what I'm going to do is take a fork. I may have needed to heat this a little bit. Come on. I was quite proud of my pretty self yesterday. I really tell everybody I don't do pretty. Um, you want to do this right before you serve it because the strawberries will make it bleed. And then what I do is take just a tiny bit of orange and just a little bit of that orange zest. So there's my crepe. Yeah. All right. So they're going to, they're going to, y'all's aren't going to be as pretty. They're going to cut them before they put all the goo on there, but you'll all get the goo. So um, this one will be mine. Hmm. All right. Abby, if you want to come get the strawberries and the whipped cream and the orange zest and all this stuff, here we go. All right. I'm going to make my polenta real quick and then we'll do the toffee candy. Man, how did y'all let me get this far behind? It's all y'all's fault. Oh, whoops. Oh. Yeah. All right. Okay. Hang on. You're like, she just brought that up, and now she's taking it back. All right, so now we want to open our ribs. Whoop. Hello. All right, how come you're saying it's okay to open? That is a way to release the pressure. I've been just letting it naturally come down. Hello. All right. Enough of that. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, let's make our polenta real quick here, and then we'll make our candy. I lost my ribs. That didn't sound right. There we go. All right. Now, polenta is a coarse ground corn. Maggie, do I have my blender? My blender's getting a real workout today. All right. Um, And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put three cups of milk and let that come to a simmer. Okay. Can you stick that in the fridge for me? All right. Okay. All right, I'm going to bring this to a simmer while I make my um, polenta. All I'm going to do for my polenta is I'm going to coarse grind my corn. Two-thirds of a cup of corn should make a cup of, 
of polenta or grits or whatever. All right, I know I have my corn. There it is. So I'm going to do about a third a cup at a time. And this will be loud and just let it go until you'll see that it kind of flings the corn up. And when it starts settling down, See how it kind of started settling down? That's my polenta. And now I'll do my next third of a cup. Um, you can, it'll be flour if you do it in the, in the Wonder Mill, it'll be flour. In the Nutra Mill, you can actually get it coarse enough that you can do your polenta. Okay. And then the recipe said, which I've never done grits like this, but it said to add a cup of water on the polenta and the salt. And you stir that. And then just set it aside until your water comes up. I mean, till your milk simmers. You put the, the water over the polenta and the salt, and now as soon as this comes up to a simmer, mm -hmm. then I'm going to add my um, polenta, this mixture to here, okay? So then, now I'm going to add this into here, and it's going to be very, very runny, just believe. In about 15, 10 minutes, it'll be thick, and it'll look like a very, very creamy, little grainy mashed potatoes is what it'll look like. So um, I use the white corn, and the white corn that we have today is just about all that we have, <laughs> and we're having trouble getting it again. So. Um, I like the flavor, I like the mild flavor of the white corn. You can certainly do it with yellow corn. So it doesn't, doesn't matter there. All right, so now we're just going to um, bring this up to a boil and then we'll turn it down to a simmer. And you want to check it. You're going to, we're going to cover it and let it cook about 10 minutes, and then it'll um, it'll thicken. But just keep checking it, so just to make sure that it's not cooking too dry and scorching on the bottom. And this is where simmer mat's very nice here to put in on this, because this will really, like I said, it's very liquidy now, but it thickens very very quickly. Okay. All right, let's, um, I, okay, it's boiling now, so I'm just going to set it aside and put it back here on simmer. Okay, now let's bring this back up. There we go. Now I can open it. 
Woo, look at that. Isn't that lovely? So we're going to set, bring everything out of it. Oh, look at that, how they're falling apart. Just put it in your serving dish. And now the recipe said to strain all these vegetables off. You were really just using it for the, those, the carrots and the onions and all that for the flavor. I'm like, I just don't waste that, you know. So um, just take this off. And then what we're going to do is we're going to, while our polenta is cooking, we're going to let this reduce the liquid. And then we'll add a little bit of cream and our chocolate right at the end. So while this is reducing and the polenta is cooking, we'll make our candy. And you can, um, I tried to skim as much of the vegetables off as I could, so I was just reducing my liquid. So you just want to scatter them throughout here. Huh? I won't. That's, I got it. I'm way multitasking now. Y'all are like, don't forget the tea. I love my tea maker, so I won't forget the tea. There's a bay leaf. We'll throw that away so somebody doesn't go, I had a leaf in my food. Okay, so we'll just let that sit here. I'm going to move this to the back. And we'll just let this simmer very hard like that. Ashley, here's a few more crepes if you need them. And then can I have, there's the burner. All right. I think I'm done with my servant girl. That's what I call this thing. All right. Candy is very, very easy. I actually want this. I like to use this when I'm stirring. All right. Let's clean out some of this stuff. You want all your ingredients ready for your candy when you start. Okay, just go ahead and do just like I've done here measure them out so that um, they're ready so that you don't have to turn and get something because you really do need to watch this. It's not that difficult to make, but you just do need to watch it. So um, let me just get to my recipe. All right, so we're going to do one. Uh, I don't know why I have two sticks of butter there. That's a little scary. It's only one cup of butter, so it's one stick. I'm thinking, what did I leave this? I mean, okay, you're right. There we go. See, I'm losing it. All of a sudden, I didn't drink enough of my energy drink, did I? All of a sudden, I'm like, okay, what did I leave the butter out of? Um, okay, so it says to grease the sides of the pot. Um, so I just take a stick of the butter. It's a little hard with it soft like this. So I just take a, one of the sticks and just do that. Huh? You could, yes, but typically I just take it right out of the refrigerator, but it's been sitting here all morning, so yeah. Softened. I didn't have that issue, but yeah, you could leave the paper on. And so now you're just going to melt your butter. Oh. 
Not two at a time, I take it. Okay. So we're going to just melt our butter. And then we've got our cup of honey granules, our cup of semi-sweet chocolate chips. I've got my tablespoon of agave nectar. And it won't take anything for me to get my water. Okay, let's, while that's melting, let me get our tea going here. Hey Maggie, if you could fill this all the way up with water, with ice, that would be great. I don't know what happened to my bowl of ice. I know you did, I just don't know what I did with it. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Is that going to be enough to fill it? Would you fill it all the way up for me? Okay, so what, um, these are two of our teas. The wild strawberry is an herbal tea. The valentine is a black tea, so it's going to have a little bit of caffeine in it. Um, but I'm going to do half and half. I'm going to do half strawberry and half um, valentine tea. Is black tea with rose petals and it has some natural chocolate flavor and natural strawberry flavor. It's a very nice flavored tea. Um, it's delicious um, as a latte, warm as a latte. It's very, very good. But I really um, thought I would do it um, today as, a, as an iced tea. Okay, see here I told you once you start this, don't do anything else. I don't know where my little measuring spoon is. Um, okay. It's um, a teaspoon of tea per cup. So if I'm making a quart, um, that is eight cups. So I need eight tablespoons of tea. So I'm going to do about half and half. So that's three, four, and then I'll do four of this one. Okay. These cook very, these burners cook really hot. I have it all the way down to three and it goes to nine. So. Hey, Abby, could you come stir this for me? It just needs a good stirring. Okay. All right, this feels like home. So all I do is I put it in my cup, screw the cup onto the lid, pour my water into my steeping pot. Simmering, turn it all the way down to one. And then just put the lid on and let it steep for about 15 minutes. And then we'll make our iced tea. All right, so now let's go back to our candy. So our butter is melted. Hmm? It was eight tablespoons. I mean, eight teaspoons. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No, I didn't think about it at all. All right, so we. Hey. All right, so there's our agave and our three tablespoons of water. I, okay, tell me again. The flavors of tea. I'm using half wild strawberry herbal and half Valentine. Um, it's a black tea. It's not an herbal. And the and the black tea flavor is chocolate covered strawberries. That's what it is. Yeah. Okay. So all you're going to do is we're going to cook this, and you do need a thermometer for to do your candy. Abby, did you take my thermometer for the bread? Okay, so when the mixture comes to a boil, you just want to adjust your heat so it continues to boil. Okay? Can y'all see it? Am I in? Okay. Am I in the picture there? So you just want to um, adjust your heat so it continues to boil. And you do not want to taste this, stick your finger in it. It's very hot. Um, and we're going to continue to boil it 
until it comes up to 290 degrees. You're gonna see how it looks kind of liquidy. It looks kind of like melted butter and sugar right now. When it starts getting close to your 290 degrees, it's going to look very, very creamy. So you do need a thermometer. I, you could get a candy thermometer that clips on, but I just use my, my bread thermometer. I love, you need a thermometer for making bread. You wanna make sure your bread is done 180 degrees. Just stick it in there. If it's not 180, pop it in for five more minutes and check it again. So I love having a thermometer on hand. So I just check my temperature occasionally. And like I said, okay, it's already at 225. It gets there pretty quickly, but it, it takes about five more minutes or so to get to 290. At this point, you really do want to have it on kind of a medium heat. You don't want to try to rush this. Don't think, well, if I put it on high, um, it'll really get there faster. Um, just, you just, because it scorches very easily at this point. So you just want to just stand here and you really don't have to just stir it all the time. At this point, you can stir it occasionally. So um, let's clear away and let me get my cookie sheet here for putting the candy on. I was very tempted to see if my um, USA pans would um, would not would you know would be enough because um, it says to line a baking sheet with either parchment. Um, this these little um, baking sheets they're silicone they can go in the oven they're nonstick sheets these are fabulous and they're really fabulous for the candy. But I didn't have the heart to mess up my whole batch of candy and stick it to my pan, so I didn't try it. I think it would come up, but it's just so much easier having um, parchment or the um, plastic down. I don't think you want to use wax paper. I think it would melt the wax, okay? So you want to do parchment or the silicone mat. Okay, I am at 250. Okay, it's going up pretty quickly. I'm going to give it a stir. <clears throat> it's steaming so much you can't really see the... I'm going to turn it down. One. You can't really see how it's changing in appearance, but it's already getting very oh, creamy yeah. looking. How were the crepes? Did you like that? Combina the combination of flavors... Wasn't it delicious? I gotta figure out how to get this on. And that, um, that filling was actually, I got the idea it was a cannoli filling. Um, so, and like I said, it was ricotta was what the cheese was. You could certainly use that, cream cheese, whatever. Um, okay, do you see how it's looking very creamy now instead of so much like melted butter and melted sugar? It's really looking creamy. This, I'm probably at about 280. I'm just, I've made it enough now that I know. Um, it's still going up, 260. Okay, let's let keep cooking. And don't be alarmed if it'll harden on your thermometer. It will comes right off in hot water. So, um, but see, this is where you don't want it to burn, which I think I just maybe turning that back up. Yeah, see what it, now it's looking really creamy here. I think I've scorched it just a tiny bit, but I'm the only one's going to eat this. Um, be warned on this. If it's around, you'll take a bite and you'll go, oh my goodness, I think I want another bite. And then all of a sudden you'll go, okay, I think I'm ill. I ate too much candy. Okay, I'm at 280. Okay, this is where you really, really don't want to rush it. I'm almost there. Ashley, if while you're waiting on the polenta, if you want to go on and pass out their treats. I was going to do it at the very end of the class and tell you happy Valentine's Day. 
We made these special candies for you. Everybody gets your own. Okay, we're good. All right, so now all we're going to do is we're going to take our candy and you want to pour it. Oh, I didn't add the vanilla dog on it. I'll just add it to part of it. You don't want to do this. <laughs> it was on my pan. There we go. We're going to. You're welcome. We're missing one person right here. Normally, I just dump it on here because you, it's going to cool very, very quickly. As soon as you add that vanilla, just stir it. But I'm just stirring it because I didn't stir the vanilla in all of it. Okay. So don't do what I just did. Okay, and then I just kind of spread it by tipping the pan here. I'm afraid to touch it because I'm afraid it will just stick. Yeah, see it's already hardening, it's already setting up. So I'm probably not quite as thin as I should be. You want to go about a quarter of an inch thick. And then you're going to, um, youch, man, today's the day to burn. You let it sit for just a couple of minutes. And then you're going to take your um, chocolate chips and just sprinkle them over. And don't worry about getting it all the way to the edge. You do want to get it sprinkled all over you don't want to just put a mound there but these are going to melt and then you're going to spread it and once it melts you can spread it all the way to the edge but you don't want to just put a mound there or they're not going to melt so you're, they're actually melting from the heat of the candy the candy is very very hot do not be tempted to lick any part of what comes out of this pot until it's hard because it is 280 degrees it will burn you so um so just uh just save that temptation don't do it you could ask me how i know <laughs> it's because it's very tempting you go oh that little string of no it's very hot sugar just does not cool down very quickly so now we just put that there. I'm going to move this away so you can so I can pull this back into view. And I'll tell you, the tool I found the handiest for spreading this is one of these little spreaders. We sell them. They're just like $1.50. They're the handiest little spreader. Um, we have them in all sorts of colors. They're right outside here by the by these silicone mats. They're right there on that same place. Now you just let this sit one or two minutes. Get any of those little stray chocolate chips. And don't wait until it looks liquid, you know, like you think, oh, there's going to melt. No, it, it's melted, and now all you have to do is start spreading it. And um, it really, you just spread, and then if it's not quite melted, just start kind of stirring it in. And it'll, it'll eventually be melted. That's kind of like if you melt chocolate chips in a pot, don't wait to stir them until they look like they're liquid. Let them get warm and then just start stirring and they'll actually melt. So I don't know if you can tell from the, the picture. They're a little bit lumpy when I start stirring and then I just keep stirring it in until they're completely melted. Hey Ashley, how did I did the, is the polenta okay or did it did I burn it? If I burned it, the stew is fine without it. But okay, all right. Okay, so see now how creamy and now I can take it now that it's all melted. There's no little lumps of chocolate chip in there. Now I can take it all the way out to my edges. Did y'all taste your candy already? Or Okay, and then I just let it 
See, but see how easy it is? I mean, the longest part is just standing here waiting for it to get up to 280 degrees. It takes about 10 or 15 minutes. And now what I have found is it'll cool. The candy itself part, the toffee part, is hardened. And what I do is just break it into pieces. But to get the chocolate hardened, I found I had to put it in the freezer. I mean, I sat it here for an hour, and the chocolate never solidified. But once I solidified it in the freezer, then it was fine. It never, it didn't melt because I took it out. But it just took sticking it in the refrigerator or the freezer for like five minutes. And um, it's very chewy when you first make it. I don't know if that kind of stuck to your teeth a little bit, but I noticed um, I took it on the leftovers after I made this on my Florida trip. And after about a week, and I didn't have it in the refrigerator necessarily, it was much more crunchy. It just got harder at the longer it w had been made. So it didn't stick in my teeth as much, almost, you know. So um, there's your candy. See how easy that was? In that very delicious, you could so make this for Valentine's gifts. I mean, and I, this could even be a little thinner, the, the toffee part. It's not going to cover the whole pan, but it certainly could have come out a little bit more had I not forgotten the vanilla. So you should put the vanilla in as soon as it reaches 290, stir it in and immediately pour it on the pan. And I literally just, you know, just kept doing this and working it until it was um, about a quarter of an inch thick is how you want it. Okay. So now this is ready. All right, so now let's make our tea and our, our um, liquid has reduced here. And all I'm gonna do to make our tea, I love this thing. Yes, you could so do this with a, um, you know, a half gallon mason jar, but this whole system is just the perfect, I was like, oh man, do I really have to <laughs> scrape that candy up? can tell I don't okay so and I have found about um, how much sweetener do I use for a half gallon I believe it's about a half a cup depends on the tea some of the stronger teas maybe like a black tea maybe needs a little bit more of the sweetener um, and then so what I do is I fill this completely with ice pour my sweetener in Pour my hot brewed mixture here. Huh? Exactly what the thing will hold, whatever it is. That's why I'm saying I love this system because it works. It's exactly what you need. Sometimes if I need just a tad bit more, I may add just a little more water here or just try to drain this completely. And there's that. And then you just put your lid on, give it a good shake, and you have iced tea ready to go in just 10 or 15 minutes. Like I said, you can so do this in a jar, but these are actually, I don't know if you can see, it's a leak proof lid. You can do these and lay them in coolers and they won't spill. Um, lay them in your refrigerator if you need to lay them down. But I just, I just love the whole system. It just works very, very well. It's just very easy to do. So there's our tea. We'll serve that with our, our ribs and polenta. Let me finish off the ribs. Hmm, which I thought surely. I wonder if that was the chocolate chips for the ribs. <laughs> okay. But no, that was on my tray. I, may, I think I didn't have. How much chocolate chips does it say? Quarter cup, okay. So we'll add our, and it's how much cream? No, uh -uh. I made some extra, so y'all, there's some over there. Is that where I'm supposed to put my cream? Tell me it is. And then my chocolate chips, removed from heat. There we go, we removed it. Yeah, cream will curdle if you like really, really cook it, so you don't wanna do that. And now I'm just gonna stir in my chocolate chips until they're melted.
Hang on. He moved it. My cameraman. All right. So there's our sauce, our gravy. And now we can pour it over here. Just pour it over our ribs. Abby, do you have the green onions? And then if I were going to serve this, oh. what? Oh, my. Your chocolate didn't melt. Okay. That's all right. just pour it back here. Chocolate wasn't totally melted. Okay. And then to take this to the table, we'll just garnish it with a little green onions. Okay. And like I said, excellent, I think, over mashed potatoes, but... Um, the recipe really suggested serving it over the polenta, so I thought, why not? You know, why not do something a little different than potatoes? But when you taste it, you'll go, okay, this could so go over mashed potatoes. Cheesy mashed potatoes. And had I not been running late, I would have put cheese in the polenta. <laughs> but, oh well. All righty. Well, now I was supposed to give you your gift, but you already had it. So now, what do we do now? Um, Okay, so we're going to say goodbye to our internet friends, and um, this is the end of the Everything Chocolate class. I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah.